understand that there is no small talk before this, but this is a formal beginning of the <laughs> seminar. Um, where we will we'll be talking with Mark Devaney, continue, I think, the conversation that we started yesterday. Um, this time I will really say only that Mark Devaney is a critical theorist that comes to us from University of Brighton. And because we will be having a long talk today, I will stop with the introduction there, if this is okay with you. Um, um, I'm just, I just want to announce that we are not going to have Jade Kuradinkovic with us today. <clears throat> and that I have a contribution by a person who is missing, Peja uh, Kristic. So if we have time in the end, I will try to translate his contribution and I think it might be interesting to you because as always his questions are great. Um, so what I propose is that we hear Mark for 20 minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> I have to be honest with you and tell you that uh, I suggested Mark uh, talks about the other parts of his book. So we heard something about populism chapter yesterday and because there are some um, references to other parts of the book, but I think that we will be also having chance to talk about them through the, the questions uh, later on. And then, uh, please do not be brief, uh, and then we will be talking. There is some kind of a the way we will talk, but we will see maybe that will change uh, in terms of how answers and questions uh, go together. Please, Mark. Um, so I, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to talk without any notes um, about the book and the project. Um, the, I said yesterday that the origins of the project lay in two, uh, two worries. One was the politics of the left always committed to what was deemed to be proper um, and as a consequence engaging in various forms of discipline, of party members, of insisting on the right political lines um, and essentially my argument is that um, in effect uh, left-wing politics for much of the 20th century betrayed its own democratic promise. So that was one aspect of the argument, and that, that's personal as well as um, theoretical, because I spent a fair amount of time in the late 1980s and the early 1990s in the political resistance against apartheid, um, in particular in a movement called the End Conscription Campaign. And the End Conscription Campaign has, well, this will go in the introduction of my book, it was a very particular campaign against the military in South Africa. It was also the place where dissidents from the party line would gather. Um, so these were people who were of the left, but were anarchists, environmentalists, um, feminists who didn't fall in with the traditional Marxist party line, um, because the student politics at that time was dominated by the Communist Party and by a particular view of organization, of secrecy, etc. So, so we, so, so we, th this organization was viewed um, almost like this institute in the description of the origins of the institute. It was kind of the place where, where the, the communist officials said, this is where you can go um, if you don't agree with the line because you're still doing useful work. Um, you're still opposing the military and et cetera. And you can have your arguments over there, but you're on the sidelines. Um, that was the one thing. But the, the other thing was my theoretical history, in terms of the political philosophy that I worked through, was affected by um, meeting with and then doing my PhD with Ernesto Leclerc. At the end of apartheid, he came to South Africa um, and did a series of workshops. And in one of the workshops, I basically tried to show him that he was wrong, which was very naive for a 20-year-old um, at this stage. But he was extremely generous, and he said to me, come and do your PhD with me, which I then went to do. Um, but one of the things that I, I remember flying into England for the first time, and anyone who's flown into England, one of the things you will notice is the way in which land is divided. The whole of England is literally squared off. Um, there is almost nothing that is, so to speak, wild. 
And of course, the origins of that go back to clearances from the lands, they go to property, to title. Um, and I always found it very strange, having lived in the colonial context, where land was in effect stolen, and then flying over Britain and seeing this world divided into property, that the post-Marxist left, and by that I mean amongst, among others, Derrida, Foucault, Lacan, Leclerc, Judith Butler, um, etc., for the most part, after the critique of Marx, simply forgot the critique of property. So it was as if we, 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 we part company with the disciplinary apparatus that is Marxism and the ways in which it tries to discipline the politics of race, gender, etc., along party lines. But at the same time, we forget the critique of political economy. So with very, very few exceptions, the critique of political economy, the critique of inequality premised on political economy was lost. So the book has its origin in those two concerns, um, how to do those together. There is a third concern, which is property is boring. And nobody really likes reading about property anymore. So <laughs> I'm trying to write about property in a manner that's not boring. Um, but for the most part, property is now left to the economists or the real estate agents. Um, and I think that's, that's very bad, actually, for politics, um, extremely bad for politics. It's deemed um, an asset to, from which one can realize value. And one of the points of investing in yourself is that you should also invest in property. Um, one of the, I, sometimes I go on AOL News, and, what, and always on AOL, the America Online, always one of the first things they have is, you should invest in this, in this now, uh, because this will realize some profit for you. Um, so I wanted to deal with that world. The book itself then is, uh, the different chapters bring those two concerns together. And I'll just give you a brief outline of each of the chapters to give you a sense of what the book's about. <clears throat> The first chapter is a rethinking <clears throat> of the theory of hegemony as it was developed by Antonio Gramsci and Ernesto Leclau and Chantal Mouffe. But it's a rethinking which goes back to the debates that took place um, between Balibar, Althusser and um, Machere and a set of other writers when they were sitting around the table reading Capital. And in the discussion of reading capital, in, in the, there is a contribution by Balibar um, when he was actually writing in a manner that was enjoyable to read, um, which is about the place of property in Marxist theory. So I go back to this moment and then I ask why it is that Leclerc and Mouffe in particular, having offered the critique of, of what, they, what Althusser used to call determinism in the last instance, determination in the last instance, why it is that they forget to do the deconstruction of that instance which Althusser argued determined in the last instance, namely the economy. So what I propose is a deconstruction of the categories of political economy as inherited from that particular reading of capital. And property is at the center of that. But what's very interesting for Marx is that property occupies two places. Property is both legal, so it's supposedly part of the superstructure, but property is also material. It's the material infrastructure that underpins the organization of society. So the question I ask in this chapter is how can we rethink a theory of hegemony which takes account of property as both so-called superstructural and so-called material? Um, because that actually, in Marx's own texts, that's the point at which the distinction of base and superstructure no longer holds together. Property is clearly something which requires legal, political order, and it's clearly something which is about the ordering of the material world, the physical world that we move through. Um, so what I develop is an idea of proprietary order, and that means that I also put into question the idea of property as it's traditionally understood. And what I mean by proprietary order, very, very simply, is that any hegemonic order, whether it be that of a particular nation state or the global rules that structure how we interact with each other, always combines rules which regulate the distribution of property, ownership, control over the means for production and the reproduction of lives. So I talk about, for example, ownership over genetic resources 
um, in recent times, but always combines that with a set of what might be called proprietary rules or a form of what is deemed to be proper. In other words, an ordering of what's acceptable behavior, of what you can do and what you can't do. And there is an intrinsic, not a necessary, but an intrinsic overdetermined relationship between these different orders. Um, they overlap, they relate to each other, they sometimes contradict each other. Um, there's no simple determination, but they're always related. So proprietary order in, and, and property, I argue, as a consequence, is not simply material. Property is also about the structuring of behavior. Um, it regulates. I gave the example yesterday. If you think about where it is you can walk and where it is you cannot walk, that is regulated by the proprietorial rules that determine access to land, um, to, to what you can do with your bodies, what you cannot do. Likewise, what you are deemed to have property of determines what you, the behaviors that you can engage in. But, even more, and sort of going from the more abstract down to the particular, what is deemed to be proper to the body is increasingly put into question by a whole set of discourses around, for example, the politics of gender, or issues around citizenship, or issues about the material basis of life. So what I'm interested in, this is why in the second chapter I turn to think about the improper, is the ways in which proprietary orders structure what is proper is increasingly being challenged or untied by improper forms of political intervention. Um, just lastly, in relation to uh, uh, property and the body, there is one last thing about the proper which is really interesting. For those of you who have Greek or Latin um, uh, classical training, if you go back to the classical Greek argument about being, the word that is used in Greek philosophy is usia. And usia is trans conventionally translated as the determination of what is proper to itself. So I, I do the sort of material work around property. I do the work around a proprietary order in terms of modes of behavior, modes of access. But I also then try to take apart ontological arguments which are premised on the assumption that we can determine what is proper to being. So I tie together these, these three different um, areas in that first chapter. The second chapter is on the politics of the improper. And in this chapter, I'm concerned to take some distance from different ways in which um, politics which is deemed to be improper has, has been practiced. And what I'm interested in here in particular is forms of resistance, forms of challenge to existing order, which always themselves are brought back to some idea of what is proper. So the, the obvious starting point is class politics where it's very clear that for, certainly after the politics of the Second International, it was very clear that for much of the 20th century, um, Marxist politics around the globe was organized around some notion of what is proper. Um, and one could have theoretical disputes, but these were always within a limit. The origins of my critique of this came with the, so, what was called the race-class debate in the context of South Africa. For those of you who don't know, Marxist theorists really struggled to come to terms with the politics of race. And effectively what they argued is that race is merely the superstructural form that capital necessarily takes. And the logic was, if we get rid of class, then all forms of racial or gender or other forms of prejudice, they did the same with feminist theories, all these other forms of prejudice will disappear. Um, so, so, so I begin with a critique of the idea that one can properly discipline. But then this leads to a second idea, which is a recognition that even if we challenge existing forms of proprietary order, and, and Foucault, I think, makes this point quite strongly, all of those challenges will themselves establish new forms of order, new forms of propriety. And it's not that we should not attempt to establish these new forms, but we always need to be wary of the moment at which the political challenges that we've supported themselves, be themselves become new disciplinary mechanisms. 
The best example of this is the debate that has erupted around the work of Germaine Greer. G Germaine Greer, a uh, second generation feminist from the 1970s of Australian origin, she wrote a wonderful book called The Female Eunuch, which was published in the 1970s. For many feminists, this was a, a seminal text um, in their coming to terms with the politics of gender, the po with the feminist politics. In the 2000s, um, Germaine Greer was a fellow, an ironic name, but anyway, a fellow at a college at, at the University of Cambridge, a woman's only college. And the person who was appointed as the head of this college happens to be a transgender woman. Um, this wasn't generally known. She had not asked for this to be widely published. Germaine Greer published an article without consulting the, uh, the woman concerned in a national newspaper in which she claimed to out this man who had taken control over the institutes. And Greer then has, for the last five or six years, insisted that a woman is a woman and a man is a man, and never the twain shall meet. Okay? Never the two shall be confused. And the consequence, of course, is a massive dispute between feminists who agree with, with Germaine Greer and a set of feminists and transgender activists who have argued that sec some second generation feminists are now themselves engaged in the forms of policing of gender that they had challenged. Um, so there's this extraordinary debate, and but what's really interesting about most forms of resistance politics, whether this be a national liberation movement that comes to seize power, whether it be a relatively, and I use the term relative given of course the massive inequalities around gender that still exist, but, but certainly a relatively successful fe global feminist movement which now finds itself caught in disputes around disciplining what it is to be a woman. Um, likewise, questions around um, race, um, questions around, um, uh, I'll give you another example that I use, um, nativism. In, um, in San Diego, during the Occupy movement, there was, uh, I don't know if any of you know about a dispute that erupted amongst occupiers. Uh, there were three groups, I use this in inverted commas, there, there was the, the typical white American liberal student occupier um, of middle class origin, um, insisting that you know, th they were down and dirty and they were properly engaged in politics. Then there were a number of activists from Black Lives Matter who were insisting to these generally young white men that they didn't understand and that the politics of Occupy itself was racist. And then there were some Native Americans, so-called Native American peoples, who claimed that even to use the word Occupy was to disrespect the fact that their land had been occupied. And it caused a massive dispute. And instead of these occupiers taking on the powers that be, the occupation just broke up into a huge argument between these three different factions who were increasingly pushed into their own corners on the basis of what it is to resist. Um, so what's really interesting, certainly on the left, is that we also end up trying to police the bounds of what is proper, of what is deemed to be proper. And I'm interested, so I'm interested, when I talk about an improper form of politics, I'm interested in thinking through two, and here I'll be slightly more theoretically precise, two implications that follow from the so-called post-structuralist change. If you remember an article by Jacques Derrida, one of my favorite pieces of philosophy, Structure, Sign and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences. In this article, Derrida demonstrates that any structure requires policing in order for the structure to be maintained, or performative reiteration, or whatever you want to call it. Um, but what he says, he then adds a footnote, he says, what has to be explained is the desire for structure. So unlike, for example, Ernesto Leclerc, who says society is an impossible object, but that impossibility becomes the desire to have the object, to establish hegemony. Okay? Unlike that argument, 
where LeCloud basically says we need forms of identification. I go back to Derrida to, Derrida to say yes, structures are improper to themselves. And if they are improper, let's not assume that we need to reintroduce these structures. Let's look and see at the different ways in which we try to police these forms of impropriety. So that's the one thing. But the second thing is I try and give an account of the improper, which is not simply a reaction to existing forms of propriety. Because one of the dangers, of course, is this, and this is what Giorgio Agamben argues in his um, 1973 book, Stanzas, in his critique of Derrida. In the second to last chapter of this, of this book, Agamben's response to Derrida is very simple. He says, look, your account of deconstruction is simply the mirror image of the ontological question of being. Um, the improper is just the other face of the proper. It always has been, it always will be. That was the case for the Greek metaphysicians as well. Um, so what I try and argue is, in fact, Agamben is wrong. Um, I mean, he's wrong for all sorts of reasons. But one of the reasons he's wrong is because he thinks there is such a thing as Western metaphysics. And I think the notion of the West is a joke. Um, it, uh, I, I'm, and I mean this literally, it was invented in the 1870s by racists. And it was the, this notion of the West was used in the 1870s as a way of distinguishing some notion of what the West was. And there is then this retroactive history that tells you a whole history of Western civilization, which was literally a racist joke from the 1880s, 1870s. So, so when people speak about the West, I, uh, I, I just want to ask them to do a bit of historical work. Um, but so, so, and I, th I just don't understand Agamben's arguments that, that the West is founded on this fundamental, um, original biopolitical division, and that this division between Bios and Zoe is replayed in different ways throughout history. So we can read the states of emergency in the 21st century as equivalent to the forms of banishment that were exercised in the by, by the Greek city-state. Um, I, I, I think this idea of this metaphysical history that is the same um, for the so-called West, as if this can be unified in some way, is mad, among other things, because the Greek world wasn't even the Western world. The Greek world was the North African world, the Babylonian world, the world of Mesopotamia. Um, so so there's, there's, there's lots of reasons to disagree with the government. But, but the other thing I disagree with is this question of what politics, a radical politics might then mean. And for Agamben, a politics is only radical if, almost like Heidegger, one suspends the original metaphysical distinction that is at the origin of what he calls the Western political framework. Um, and that just means that all forms of politics, no matter what they are, will be inauthentic, unless they somehow address this origin, originary biopolitical paradigm. I think this is deeply conservative. Um, you end up with some quasi-Catholic messianic idea about what the future politics might be. And I know that's a, an unfair description of Agamben, but, that, but I can't help but feel that underlying some of what happens is, is that. So, so I reject that account of the improper, but I do argue with Derrida that, that there are no forms of proper order. And as a consequence, it's not a matter of saying that the improper is simply a reflection of the proper. It is simply the case that no for all forms of propriety will always have to defend themselves. And that goes back to my critique of the logic of being. If, if, if there is nothing proper to being, then to say what is the case is always to engage in a politics. So in this respect, I do agree with the Gumben that philosophy is always politics um, from the beginning, which means that most English philosophers don't do philosophy. Um, but that's a different matter. Um, analytical philosophy isn't, philo isn't, isn't philosophy. Um, I, I hope I've offended somebody. Um, the, so those are the two sort of primary theoretical chapters um, in, in, in the book. I then have four chapters, two of which I've spoken about here. One is the chapter about populism and one is a chapter about democracy. The other two chapters, um, one is about the notion of performativity. Um, and the reason I speak about the idea of performativity is because it links together a range of philosophical traditions and a range of philosophical positions 
which Judith Butler beautifully replays. And also, but because Butler uses this notion of performativity in the various accounts of precarity, dispossession um, that she gives. So the chapter is both um, a look at the origins of the account of performativity and at the same time a critique of Butler's account of dispossession. And I'll just speak about two of those two things separately. The or performativity was first developed um, by the philosopher John Austin in a wonderful book called How to Do Things with Words. Um, and in this book, what Austin points to is that when we speak, we always do something. There is always some type of performative force at play. I mean, the argument's slightly more precise than that, the distinction between the illocutionary and the perlocutionary and the different dimensions of speech. But this notion of performativity was then picked up by John Searle, and Searle essentially reduces performativity to consciousness. Um, he ultimately individualizes performativity and, as a consequence, depoliticizes it. It's also picked up in the critical theory tradition. Habermas picks up the idea of performativity to argue that what he calls the illocutionary force of speech is what underpins what he calls communicative rationality. Derrida then picks up a critique of Austin, and Butler picks up Derrida's reading of Austin in order to rethink the politics of gender. So this, the history of performativity is a history of disputes in the 20th century between analytical and critical theoretical and French and decolonial thought around performativity and politics. So I, 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 I retrace this in, ter in trying to give an account of performativity which points to what I'd spoken about in the previous chapter, that performativity, insofar as performativity points to the need to police the bounds of order, it also points to the possibility of subverting those forms of order which is an argument that Butler will then make. Um, I then look at Butler's account, um, and here I, I develop, I, I both accept much of her work, because I think she, of all of the theorists I speak about, she is um, in many respects closest to the arguments I want to develop. But I develop two particular critiques of Butler. One is the account of dispossession, um, when she, not the account of dispossession, but of material dispossession, but the argument that in order to become a self, one is dispossessed, um, which seems to me to presuppose that in the process of becoming a self, there is already something that is proper to the self. I just don't think the notion of dispossession makes sense. Um, I think rather one should say that the possibility, be more positive in other words, construct this in positive terms, the very possibility of being a self depends upon a set of relations with others which are not a matter of dispossession, they are in fact the very material that makes up the self. So, so I reject uh, Athanasio and Butler's account of dispossession. Um, the other thing I object to is the way in which Butler plays with the notion of precarity. Um, in part, and again this goes back to make, insisting that an improper politics is always positive, in part because if you go back to the word precarity, what precarity refers to is the confessor who goes before God asking for forgiveness. Precarity is always an act of submission before the big other from whom one is seeking some type of um, forgiveness. I personally do not think of politics of precarity, given the lineage and the genealogy of this term, um, is very useful. So it's not so much a critique of Butler as an attempt to rework the ways in which she deploys certain <coughs> concepts, um, whilst recognizing that she herself is engaged in a performative politics. Um, in other words, I think her response would be, look, these are interventions, always. Philosophy is always an intervention. It's not an ontological attempt to establish categories which are themselves proper. The, the other chapter which I haven't spoken about and which uh, is the complement to the chap chapter on proprietary order is a chapter about the politics of equivalence. This is partly a rereading of Marx. It's partly a rereading of contemporary th readers of Marx. And it's premised on a really, really simple argument. Um, there was a proper reading of capital. 
which I've spoken about in the earlier parts of the book. And the proper reading of capital was that the origins of value lie in the work that is produced by, the, by collective labor, by the workers of the world who must unite and overthrow capital. The subject object of history, as Georgi Lukacs will argue in History and Class Consciousness. Um, however, if you go back to capital and read what Marx actually says, the problem that he has is that he cannot determine the true origins of value. And the reason he can't do so is because he says two things which are contradictory. On the one hand, he says that commodities are produced by workers, and workers are alienated from their labor, etc., that traditional argument. But he then says, however, in itself the commodity has no value until the point at which it is exchanged. And he speaks about the variety of conditions which might shape whether or not the value of the commodity is to be realized. And these include things like financial investments, crises, wars, a whole set of contingent factors which mean that what value is cannot be determined by the traditional Marxist account of the labor theory of value. So that's the first step, is to offer a critique of that version of Marxism. The second step is then to think about the logics of equivalence in financial terms, and to ask about the ways in which logics of equivalence structure the worlds that we live through and work in. One of those is money, okay, the ultimate form of equivalence, which uh, almost in a mystical fashion determines and structures what we can and cannot do. I remember someone I used to know uh, uh, receiving PhD funding to come and study in the United Kingdom. And the country he received the funding from had a political crisis. And overnight, the value for his PhD funding was reduced by half. And he couldn't go. So literally overnight, because of games of financial equivalence, the very possibility of him leading the life that he had planned to live was destroyed. So the, what I'm interested, uh, what, I, what I then begin to do is to rethink forms of financial equivalence as a form of hegemonic articulation. In other words, if hegemony, the way Leclerc argues about it, is partly about the creation of a cultural hegemony, a common logic, something similar to what Grumpy describes, in which a variety of different civil society groups will combine into a hegemonic formation. There is another form of organization which is done through financial and equivalential logics, which is not based upon language, which is the post-structuralist argument. It's not based upon meaning, but it's based upon the organization of the way in which we move through the world, through financial logics, calculus of logics, accounting logics, which are not reducible to the cultural analysis of hegemony. So in this chapter, my aim is to lend to the theory of hegemony a more profoundly critical account that allows us to address the forms of financial equivalence and financial hegemony that structure the worlds in which we live today, and which then politically requires a rethinking not only of hegemonic articulation between political groups, but recognizing that hegemonic articulation is also about control of currency, control of finance, structural logics, um, some of what the, the great structuralists thought through um, that was lost in the turn to the focus on language. Um, so that's the book, broadly speaking. Um, I'm nearly finished, um, but I've got three months of editing um, and, then, and then it will be done. And one of the problems is to make sure that all the chapters properly link up and that they all work, as well as working by themselves. Um, so I apologize for references to other chapters, but because it's part of a, a book, obviously, there's no way past this. Okay. I don't know how long I spoke for, probably too long. Um, and can I say one last thing? I yeah, want please. to say thank you to Adriana, but also to you, because I know that to read 12,000 words and to then prepare questions and come and sit in a seminar. It's a very great privilege, so thank you. <laughs>
Thank you for sending us the text. It was my suggestion, basically, to, for Mark, Mark to send us the text, which is not over yet, because I think this is this is a kind of a situation where we maybe can help in a way with our questions. And I, uh, being in a position to already know at least the direction that the questions will take, I think I think is going to be helpful. So what I propose we do now is um, maybe split the thing in two. So we can have a little break at some point, especially important for the cigarette addicts. Um, and yes, of course, <laughs> you know, self-interest is always what motivates me. Um, but and Sorry, no, no, it's okay. Uh, so what I thought is um, the, the text begins, as all you know, with three um, three propositions and that these are democracies, the enactments of equality, democracy undermines orders of property and propriety, and the third one, democracy is not a regime. I thought of maybe dividing us with our questions um, with regards to these three propositions. It's not that easy to do that because some people have different questions, so some would combine the first and the third or the second and the third, but I would propose that we begin like this. So with, I, I just want to say that I, I did a make, didn't make a short introduction to Mark of all of you, so he knows what you do in your uh, theoretical life, and also in private ones. Uh, <laughs> so in any case. <laughs> Um, um, I, I, I propose so that we begin with Olga Nikolic, who would ask something about what power lies in democracy and about democracy and anarchism. Then with Marc Lachance, who will ask something about Lockean understanding of property and Marxian understanding of equality. Then with Maria Nivković, who will talk about enactment as a form of domination and undermining, undermining in market society, then with Srijan Prodanovic, who will say something about the meaning of the majority, about the sovereignty and property, and will ask something about Jewish conception of democracy. And the fifth one would be Bilena Djordjevic, who would go with agonism versus antagonism and conceptualizing democracy, and about what is improper in improper democracy. And then the five others of us will go after the break. Uh, it's only the, the first name. I can, but I can write it down to you, for you. So, uh, Olga, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, Olga, yeah. So, uh, I would like to ask for some clarifications regarding your view of democracy as opposed to democracy as a regime. And on the other hand, democracy as a radically horizontal form of collective decision making. Um, I agree with you that all known democratic regimes reserve equality only for some, and thus that they are not democratic in the sense of equality for everyone. And I do believe that we should come closer to this ideal. However, um, my first question is, isn't this equality supposed to be, first and foremost, equality in making collective decisions? And if so, aren't we supposed to somehow manage this process of collective decision making in order to practice democracy? Which would then include putting some limits on who can participate and how, thus making it in a sense more orderly and proper, what I have in mind is <laughs> an example of many contemporary bottom-up social movements that attempt to be radically democratic, and yet precisely in order to protect this equality, they need to invent new democratic forms of collective decision-making. And precisely because this equality is very fragile, they need mechanisms, certain mechanisms to protect it. For example, instead of majority votes, in Occupy, we had uh, elaborate uh, <coughs> stages, uh, institutions of discussions and debates aimed at reaching consensus. And because they wanted to avoid the tyranny of the majority problem. This at the same time 
is aimed at what you said about consensus in the text and uh, how a democracy is founded on disagreement rather than consensus. <laughs> here, uh, so here for them, consensus plays an important role. Also, they are very wary of the iron law of oligarchy problem, stating that even in a radically democratic movement, certain informal groups will eventually gain more influence and that there will always be a leadership or an elite within a political organization. So they are trying to pay attention to signs of this and in order to eliminate this form of domination within and preserve equality within the movement. Um, so my question is, is this kind of organizing still a regime in your sense? Or do you see new social movements such as the one described, uh, <clears throat> partly realized uh, through an Occupy movement, for example, as places where democracy is enacted. Yeah. And this is, for me, what motivates this entire question is the question, basically, how, do we, how are we supposed to enact democracy? So you mentioned yesterday that we occasionally, spontaneously enact it alone or together, and that even regimes occasionally enact democracy, but since we are still living in an undemocratic order, shouldn't we make attempts at organizing? Or do you think that this will again necessarily lead to a, a regime? And you already mentioned just now that you think that we should make attempts and that it will lead to a regime. So I guess. <laughs> That, that part of the question is already answered, but my question is, every, is every order necessarily bad, exclusive, etc., or is it possible to create order that will still remain inclusive and open-ended enough, which will, and will allow for the continued existence of the community based on these democratic principles? So, which is basically how I imagine and how I understand this anarchist movement um, of Occupy, for example, where we have, um, you know, uh, anarchism, but not opposed to organization, in a way. But this attempt to create a radically democratic organization. Uh, so, uh, let me see. Yes, and this is linked to the question of power, uh, what kind of power democracy is. So, because, again, from your examples that you mentioned yesterday, at least in the first two examples, these representatives of the demos seemed more uh, powerless than powerful to me. Like the, the first Sorry, two. I didn't get that. So, uh, so, the representative of the demos from the examples you gave mm -hmm. yesterday, mm -hmm. the one with yeah. cancer and the one with, um, yes. yeah, the, in Slovenia, yeah. The erased. Uh, they seem more power, powerless than powerful, and then my, that, that's, I mean, that's the question: What is the power of the demos? Uh, is it and is it like more like a, because it invokes? When I'm reading the, te the text, the text it invokes uh, an image of a sleeping volcano that occasionally and predictably erupts and disrupts the order, but. Uh, but can it be something more in the sense of collective, the power of collective decision-making process where truly everyone has an equal say? Okay. okay. That's my question. Yeah, shall I? Yeah, shall I? It, um, if that's okay? Because um, otherwise I'll, I'll lose track. So, so thank you. Um, they're not easy questions to answer, but I'm, I'm going to answer to begin just indirectly. Um, one of the things which, I think there's always a prejudice of the present in the way in which we study political society. And what I mean by that is if you accept what um, archeologists argue, um, human beings have only existed for approximately 200,000 years. And of those 200,000 years, state formations have only existed for something like one thousandth of that period. So the earliest forms of state formation go back to about 3000 BC, maybe slightly be 5000 BC perhaps. But this is a tiny period of time relative to the amount of time that human beings have been on the planet. Now, I'm only, uh, James C. Scott 
um, the anarchist historian has, has recently done some, a really wonderful book looking at this history. But the reason I'm, I'm, I'm talking about things this way is I don't think that we should assume that the forms of decision making, the forms of organization that exist today are the forms of organization that have of necessity to exist. Um, so the state, the nation state, for example, is of relatively recent invention. Um, and yet you would swear, if you read what most political theorists write about, that the only form that politics can take must somehow be mediated by the nation state and its relation to global institutions. So, 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 so I'm, I, I, want, I want in part to be... Sorry? I'm complaining. Yeah, sorry, sorry. It's okay, you can complain. No, no, no. This is the political theorist. I'm not political theorist. I'm here. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, so, but, can I? Well, yeah, I was but, but, about, like, it's not, yeah, I'm not Can I? But I'm just trying to be precise about this. It's not that political scientists or political theorists don't recognize that there are other forms of political organization. But the key concern when one talks about democracy is the relationship between, for example, social movements and collective representation. And it's always organized around state formation and the relation of states to global international institutions. And those tend to be the questions, certainly the political theorists circulate around. Um, anyway, so, but, the, but the, the reason I, I make this point about James C. Scott is, is that there is, a, there, there is a longer term, if we think in the, in the longer term, then we, we need to think beyond the communities of interest that we participate in, which are often national, um, not always, but often national. So that's one, one concern. I want to think democracy without assuming that democracy has to somehow be subsumed within the forms of regime that we today have. So, so in part, this is an abstract idea. And what I mean by that is let me try and be consistent about what equality might mean and what democracy might mean. Um, which is why I use the example from Rousseau. Because Rousseau uniquely, not just Rousseau, in fact, all of the social contract theorists recognize that the moment at which the contract founds the state both establishes some type of political equality, maybe not in Hobbes, but some type of political equality, and that political equality is at the same time the introduction of inequality. So what comes to be called the liberal democratic regime is always premised upon the enactment of some forms of inequality. Now, that's not to argue that there shouldn't be forms of regime. It's simply to recognize what I think has to be the case. That when we do engage in the forms of collective decision making that you're speaking about, we, we engage in decision-making procedures which of necessity will not be democratic. So that, that's the first thing, is that I think we need to recognize that the collective forms of life are never properly democratic, um, rather than allowing this terminology to be used all the time um, by regimes which claim to be democratic. Um, collective decision, even in the Occupy movement, I do not think that um, this was entirely democratic, um, in part because these were self-constituting communities and there's always the question of those who don't want to participate and those who don't want to be bound. Um, there's a very famous example from St. Paul's, which, which I love. Um, a policeman came up to the St. Paul's occupiers. And this is, I don't know if this is true, but it's one of these stories that now circulates. A policeman came up to the occupiers and said, look, you have to move. We have a legal order that says you must leave. Um, you can't stay here. By six o'clock this evening, you must be gone. And the, the person who was speaking on behalf of the occupiers said, um, well, I, I can't agree. Um, however, uh, we'll take it back to the, collect, to, to the assembly and we'll make a collective decision about whether or not we stay or whether or not we go but you're welcome to come and join us as long as you agree that whatever decision we reach you will abide by and of course the policeman couldn't say yes to this 
Because the reason he, he couldn't say yes is because he's subject to the authority of the state. Um, so there is no possible way he could agree to do this. But the point the occupier was making is a, very, is a very democratic point. If you participate in the deliberation, then you are subject to the decision that is made in the deliberation, um, even if it is the case that you might disagree um, with what is being said. Um, so just to summarize, I think that we do need collective decision making. I think in the world we live in, this, it's impossible not to. But I also think collective decision making will always have both elements that enact equality and elements that undermine equality. Um, I think there's no way around that. Um, which means that in the day-to-day -day real world of engaging in politics, one has to make really horrible, difficult decisions. Um, you know, really simple things like um, in Britain, the National Health Service decentralizes its budget. And in every region, there is a committee that decides how much money gets spent on different parts of the health service. But they're making decisions about people's lives. Because if they decide to cut the funding to elderly care, because they want to look, about young, look after young people, then there is a limited amount that can be spent on elderly care, which means some drugs might not be bought because they're too expensive. So, so in a situation like this, it's not that one deliberately acts to treat people unequally. It is just the case that structurally there is no other way to act. Um, so we need to recognize that as well. Um, but, but, but having said all of that, I want to be as consistent as I can about what equality might mean and what democracy might mean in order precisely to maintain the edge of criticality that allows us always to identify and pick up those practices which claim to be democratic but are not. So there is always a sense in which democracy is not realized. Not that it's impossible. I don't want to be Derrida, you know, the, the, the democracy that never, democracy to come, democracy a venire, um, because then we're always waiting for some type of specter to arrive out the, uh, out from its ghostly presence. I think democracy is enacted, it's done. But even in its doing, it will always run into all sorts of tumultuous problems. Um, having said that, there is one last thing. I think one of the problems is the stories of democracy that we tell ourselves are empirically very light. And what I mean by that is we could write a different history of democracy. Imagine a history of democracy which was not a history of regimes. So it didn't begin with Athens and then go from Athens to the Republican states of Italy, from the Republican states to the emergence of liberal democracy, from liberal democracy to socialism, from socialism to deliberative democracy, from deliberative democracy to radical democracy, in this great narrative of democratic progress that political theorists tell themselves. Imagine a different history. Imagine we attempt to reconstruct an historical account of the moments when people have attempted to enact and practice democratic engagement, regardless of institutional regimes. The diggers in the, uh, in the English Revolution, who basically said, um, the, the diggers' manifesto was very straightforward. The landlords have no right to the land, and if we work for them, we are giving them our money and our labor. Therefore, we will till the land and we won't give them anything and we will distribute what we take to everybody around us. Okay, so you get a tiny village in Surrey in England, a tiny village which basically takes on the authority of the whole nation state. Because it basically says the local lord has no authority, this land is our land. And then organizes common forms of ownership. Why is that, that, is that not part of democratic theory textbooks? Why are all sorts of practices engaged in by people all around the world, in every single type of society, which anthropologists have written about, why are these not part of the story of democracy? So, so my other, you know, one might say I've bent the stick too far, but the other side of this is that the narrative of democracy that political theorists have told is, in my view, it's a fable. It's a mythical story. Um, Democratic practices take place and have taken place in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of times. Um, read Herodotus. 
In Herodotus' histories, three Persian kings have a debate about what to do after the death of the emperor. One of them says we must have a, a, a monarch. The other says, no, we need an, aristoc an ar ar aristocracy. The third says, and, and Herodotus, a Greek historian, is having a go at the Greek idea that they are at the origins of democracy. The third says, no, there are many assemblies all over Persia, pe places where people gather in villages to make decisions about what they do with crops, what they do with all the resources, how they respond to he says, what we need is democracy. We don't need a king. Let people decide for themselves. But who in the history of democracy writes about Herodotus and the Persian Empire? Um, there's, there's another great story in Herodotus, which is even better, which is about a group of people who disappeared in the desert. They saw an approaching sandstorm, and the, they, they don't know what to do. And at this moment of greatest crisis, they all sit down, the woman, the men, and the children, and they agree that everybody should have the right to decide what to do, given that they are being approached by imminent death. And they recognize that they're all going to die. So what they do is every single member of the community gets a spear, and they march into the desert sands with the spear aimed at the storm that's going to kill them. It's a great story about democracy. It's a horrible story. Um, so, so what I'm interested in is, is it, to go back to, to, to empirical research, historical research, is to rethinking. If you think democracy is enactment and is a practice, what does it mean to rethink the history of the story we tell ourselves um, with communities that are different to the communities, the regimes that dominate the story of, um, of democratic practice? There are some historians like James C. Scott, for example, who try to do this. Some of the anarchists. Sorry, that was a long answer, but... Thank you. Unfortunately, um, I did not mention Marx at all. I would focus myself on the question of property. It seems to me that uh, the political and ontological problem of the proper, of property and propriety, plays a central role in your book. Yeah. You mentioned John Locke, among others the way that he described the man who is, I'm quoting Locke himself, a proprietor of his own person and the actions or labor of it and has in himself the great foundation of property. Yeah. I can see that you are first and foremost relying upon uh, the, the interpretation given by Etienne Balibar. Yeah. Now, when in this context, I would like to draw your attention to another philosopher who relies upon Balibar's interpretation, but who seems to go much deeper than Balibar himself. I am referring to the book of Alain de Libera. The title is Naissance de Sujury, and it belongs to his big project of the archaeology of the subject, Archaeologie du Sujet. From page 188 onward, onwards, he analyzes the way that the concept of subjectivity was constituted as something being my own, as self-ownership, as property, mm -hmm. as non-transferability, as inalienability. Um, a claim that the libera goes historically and philosophically deeper than Balibar does because he goes back even to the sources of Locke's inspiration to Plato's first Archibiades mm -hmm. which already mentions the distinction what is me as the soul and what is my own what belongs to me as my body and to Plotinus as well but also takes into consideration some current definitions of subjectivity as ownership, as being mine and my own. For instance, the way that uh, in the 20th century Heidegger defines being there, Dasein, as minus, yeah. je meinigkeit, or the way that Paul Ricoeur analyzes the minus, mianete, of the body, or as Ricoeur puts it, la naturalité du one's own. Now, I don't want to go into details, uh, to cut a very long and complex story short, 
the Libera stresses that there was a decisive turn, a rupture in the history of subjectivity, precisely with regard to subjectivity as property. Yeah. This, turns, uh, this turn happens with a philosopher from Constantinople, Themistius, who wrote very important commentaries for the works of Aristotle and whose work later influenced Thomas Aquinas. According to Delibera, it is with Themistius that a rigorous distinction is made between what is me, myself, and what is mine, my being, <coughs> between ego on the one hand and me, esse, on the other. And what's the point here? Why is it a decisive turn when Thomas Aquinas uses this distinction made by Themistius? But in this context, what is me, myself, is defined as a mere potentiality, as a general possibility of the use of the intellect, <coughs> while, on the other hand, what is mine, my being, me esse, is conceived as my concrete action, as my particular use of the intellect. It would simply, from this historical point on, mm -hmm. it is claimed that what is the most valuable in me is not much myself, but what is mine. What is mine is property. So when Locke speaks of the man who is appropriator of his own person and the actions of it, in fact, he merely repeats an ancient and medieval distinction. What is mine is my activity. Now, why could the, this be extremely exciting from the perspective of your, so to say, Ranciarian yeah. analysis? <laughs> it is because when Thomas Aquinas used the <laughs> distinction between what is myself and what is mine, he was fighting against a strong medieval tendency, namely Averroism. I have to simplify things very much now, but we might describe Averroism as a philosophy according to which there is a unity of the intellect, according to which there is a universal intellect and a universal capacity shared by everyone. Thus, when Thomas Aquinas defines subjectivity as what is mine as an activity and the property, and when he wrote his famous treatise entitled On the Unity of the Intellect Against the Averroists, which is one of the most important debates in the long history of medieval philosophy, he was in fact uh, defining subjectivity in an anti ranciarian way, in a non-democratic way, is something that is not necessarily universally inclusive, which is not open, which is not an external source shared by as many as possible, but is something <coughs> particular, limited and selected as property, <coughs> in fact. Um, so long before John Locke, mm -hmm. long before mine is being defined as a thing that is my property, subjectivity itself was defined as a non-shared and so to say somewhat metaphorically as, non as a non-democratic property. And this discussion is uh, also extremely important in contemporary philosophy of uh, mind in the debates between what is internal and external, what is phenomenal onus mm -hmm. and, and what is from within on the one hand and what is publicly accessible and given, uh, given for, for others as well. To sum it up, I think these questions might deserve your attention. Um, so thank you, that's incredibly useful. Um, I don't know deliberate text, so I'm going to try and find this. So thank, thank you, that is um, really useful. Um, one, of the, um, one of the difficulties with, with any text as you know, is where you place the limits. Um, and one of the problems I, I had, for example, reading Giorgio Agamben's work, is the ways in which um, Agamben, for example, will take the questions of property back to debates within Catholic theology um, around what it is to be a monk, what it, how, how one should live, whether or not one has property, 
which goes back to debates with Aquinas and a whole set of other theologians about the origins of property. And I made a decision that I was, for the purposes of the book, because it's a political intervention in part and a theoretical intervention in existing debates in this book, I'm not going to um, do the work, which is a, probably a lifetime's labor, um, which Liberis de Liberis seems to have done, of going back and tracing, doing a genealogy. But one of the one of the purposes of such a genealogy would be precisely to put into question the ways in which what we take now take for granted, as Foucault indicated, is always premised upon the repression or the exclusion of other possibilities. Uh, and, and you've already indicated, for example, in the debates Aquinas intervenes in, the possibilities of other ways of thinking being, or thinking what it is to be. Um, the, the one reason I put the quote from Plato's The Laws in was precisely because in this you also get a completely different notion um, of what the self might be, what democracy might be, um, which doesn't refer back to what's proper to the self. Um, so, I mean, my response is, first of all, thank you. Um, secondly, um, I want to ask you a question. Um, is there something about these debates that you think would modify the ways in which I've presented the account of the improper. I read only this one chapter. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because, you know. There I, is I, a certain potential. There's a potentiality, yeah. There's a potentiality, especially in the Averroian tradition that you mentioned. Yeah. It goes counter to the whole early modern or late medieval and then modern tradition of the same century period, right? There is an intersubjective potential in that sense. Just a short story, short. I don't mind intersubjective as long as it's not Habermas, but that's a different question. Um, <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, I'm interested in going back to those traditions, but it, it probably won't be in this book, although what I will do is, is cert I'm going to read Delibera, and I may well put a footnote in and say thank you, um, because that's important. It's uh, one of the problems is in, and I repeat what I've already said one shouldn't do, is that political theory is constituted by a set of foundational texts. Um, so everybody always refers back to Locke. I said to Adriana, I'm not certain I'm going to keep Locke in this chapter. Um, because to do so is precisely Lock to repeat. Him out. Yeah. Lock so, him out. Lock him out. Yeah. <laughs> but can, I, can I just ask, I mean, uh, I, I just sent, if, if it's okay. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because I just sent to Mark uh, an email saying, say, please send this to me. Uh, but the idea is basically, I mean, what does this wonderful history of the subjectivity, how does it undermine the idea that the yeah. idea is... I didn't suggest that it undermines in any way. Yeah. I just want us to go historically a little bit. Do a bit more historically. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but I mean, my only response to that can be, yes, of course, this, uh, this is really important. Um, and, and I mean, the one clear thing is that Locke is working in a certain Christian tradition. He's working both out of and f within a certain account of Christianity. Um, and he's responding in part to the debates around the place of Catholicism um, in, um, in Europe at the time. Um, so, so obviously, I suspect, I'm sure, Locke, Locke must have been familiar with, with these debates. It would have been part of the classical education that he had. Um, so, yeah. More work to do. Uh, yeah. Um, I will, in a way, uh, take a few points from Walker's question. Um, as I'm also very interested in um, how you, and you, 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 you kind of um, already um, given a lot of Marianne. elaboration in your, in your introduction, in the way you clarified many of the dilemmas that I have, and it would be great when the book comes out. I'm very interested to see the other chapters as well. But um, the relationship between regime and democracy, uh, as you have indicated today in the introduction and expounded upon the ideas from the text a little bit, um, it's always, it seems to me, what Hegelians would call a dialectical relationship, right? Uh, and would you agree with this? I mean, 
I would, I would like to hear even more about the relationship between between regime and the enactment of democracy, and especially um, in the sense that it seems to me that that very often, I mean, or maybe even um, I mean, intrinsically, regimes are the necessary preconditions for the constitution of democratic actors. It seems to me that right. Uh, um, so, as you said in your introduction, you 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 know if if there is no regime, then there is the next of democracy. But I have a, a different a different kind of um, problem in mind, which is um, um, have we not limited enactment of democracy to only those who are oppressed within a regime? If we say that. Uh, in the enactment of democracy is the opposite. Mm -hmm. But what about those actors who are not oppressed by a regime, but take part? You've given the example with the Occupy movement, which then splits into three different factions, and this is an unfortunate thing, of course. It would need not have split, uh, but then these identity politics came into play, right? Uh, so my uh, and, and in, in, in then in that point, those actors who did not really belong to the oppressed within the regime were labeled as not really understanding what's going on. Now, this kind of logic then is premised upon the idea that the, the enactment of democracy can only be done by those who are oppressed by a regime, which I do not share. So it seems to me, well, one example could be, let's say, the post-World War II welfare state, definitely not a democracy, a regime, right? A, a proprietary regime that is then succeeded by the neoliberal proprietary regime mm. which talked about yesterday. But didn't wasn't this regime in a way a precondition for the constitution of of those very actors who then undermined that regime and joined forces with those who were oppressed in a genuine way, I mean. In that sense, uh, this kind of ties in with, with my general kind of intuition that, you know, um, um, autonomy is intrinsically dependent upon uh, intersubjective relations. It's constituted through forms of interaction that are mutually uh, you know, re reciprocal, they're not, that are free of domination. Yeah, I am part of Habermasian. But in that, in that sense, these relations can only be established, symmetrical relations, intersubjective relations between actors, if forms of domination that are historically rooted are overcome, and for the overcoming of these forms of domination, let's say, state intervention was crucial in certain periods, and it seems, I, it seems difficult to conceive how otherwise these forms of domination within the family and private sphere could have been overcome except through what Olga referred to as collective will formation through institutional means and then dismantling these forms of domination. Uh, and then, let's say the flip side of this question is, can the enactment of democracy also function as a form of domination within the neoliberal proprietary regime? Can there be a simulated kind of enactment of democracy? And what I have in mind is, it's, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not very, very developed, but let's say if we go to, to, to authors who study the neoliberal kind of logics of justification, like the New Spirit of Capitalism, like Lutansky, or, or, or some of the work of contemporary critical theory, like Fraser and, and Axel Honneth, um, then there is this whole uh, anti-hierarchical, anti-regime discourse within, within, let's say, the managerial literature, right? Within, within these justifications for the dismantling of the welfare state, right? There is often very, very strong kind of um, focus on on uh, creating non-dominating, non-hierarchical collectivities which work together uh, through collective decision making. Of course, this is all simulation, but it seems to me that, that the anti-bureaucratic, anti-regime kind of sentiment is crucial to the logics of neoliberal justification. Yeah. Also, then, yeah. Now, and just short third question. That, so you spoke a lot today about uh, hegemony being constituted also through means of monetary equivalence, yeah. and and this uh, this of course um, then um, 
opens up the question is since monetary equivalence is kind of totalizing, a totalizing force, uh, you argue that states are not unitary, not monolithic, they are kind of, you mentioned the term hodgepodge in the text. The hodgepodge are different institutions, different It's one of my favorite words, so I had to yes. put it in the text. Uh, and then uh, but then monetary equivalence, of course, creates a kind of totality that critical theory has spoken a lot about, the market society, the, the, the logic of universal exchange and, and abstraction. Um, is enactment of democracy, does it necessarily require that we challenge this logic? Since it seems to me that most forms of um, radical democratic protest target what might be called political and cultural logics of hegemony, but the economic, the logic of hegemony just cost you, you, you mentioned yesterday Tony Blair and, and, and the betrayal of social democracy, we live and die at the mar on the market, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, will it be possible to really undermine this logic of exchange to democratic action, to net into democracy in any meaningful way, uh, and achieve anything in that respect um, Okay, so, so I'll, I'll try to, to answer all of them. Um, I, I don't buy the Hegelian dialectical logic um, insofar as that dialectics in Hegel always in some sense presumes the possibility of a reconciliation. Um, and what I take as fundamental is an antagonism that is ultimately irresolvable. Um, so in that respect, I am with the post-Marxist critique of, of Hegel. And, um, or, or alternatively, with a reading of Hegel which interprets dialectics in, in a somewhat different way. Um, one that's perhaps more uh, closer to Pippin or um, cert certain contemporary reinterpretations of Hegel. But that, that, that's a, I don't think that's the most important thing. Um, the, the, the issue, I think, goes back to what Olga was asking um, around democracy, enactments, the con intersubjectivity of the state. Um, so the social welfare state, let me talk first of all about that. Um, there's a fantastic text published by Jürgen Habermas in, I think, 1979 in the English translation called Legitimation Crisis, um, which is one of my favorite books by Habermas, um, much better than Theory of Communicative Action. But that's it. it um, and in, in, in this book, what he looks at is the series of crises that he argues beset the social democratic state, motivational crises, legitimation crises, and a set of other crises. Which, which are both individual, um, cultural around moral orders, instrumental around the organization of the technological organization of the world. But he refers in this book to the particular enactment of disempowerment that takes place in the social democratic state for those who come to rely on the state for their ability to live. Now, what, what's really interesting about this account in Habermas is not that he at the time is saying we should get rid of the social democratic state, but he's recognizing that the, the social democratic regime, which is a response in effect to the two world wars and to the 1929 crisis, so the, the, the agreements that are reached in the post-war consensus are in part looking back to what happened in, in 1929 and the fallout of that over the next three decades, um, what Habermas recognizes is that this regime, which, which attempts to implement forms of improvement to the welfare of citizens, at the same time reintroduces new forms of power. And in that respect, my argument is quite close to Habermas, that any form of regime um, will always introduce new logics of domination, which we don't necessarily anticipate, things that we don't expect. And that part of the purpose of, of critique, uh, this is something that I think Habermas in an informal comment, he says that when he was asked what is critique, and I think he describes it as a thorn in your backside. Um, 
cr critique is the thorn that always undermines what you do. And, and I, 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 I agree with Habermas about this, that whatever the form of regime that takes, we should not take for granted that there are not other ways of improving and changing and, and doing. The, the problem is, of course, that the right-wing critics then use the work of Habermas, James O'Connor, who wrote The Fiscal Crisis of the State in, in, in the same period. They take those works as the basis for arguing that the social democratic state is a failure, etc. Now, you probably gather from me making these comments that I, I would far prefer that we lived in a social democratic state um, or what or social welfare state. Um, and, and what that indicates is something which is not developed in, in this text, because it's not part of the argument about the text, that I think we always have to make judgments about the states in which we live. And we always have to try and ensure that those states act in a manner that, to go back to your questions, that insofar as possible represents collective interests in a manner that enacts forms of equality. But we need to recognize that the states will always not be able to do that at the same time. Um, so this is just very straightforward. There's no, I don't think, I don't think there's a problem with that. The purpose of the, of my argument about democracy is really simple. I want to reclaim democracy from the state. Not because I'm an anarchist, but because I do not think that any state has ever acted democratically. Which is not to say, to go back to your question, that states sometimes act in a manner that does as you've suggested, introduce forms of equality. Okay. One of the great mechanisms for this was the use of taxation to redistribute wealth. Okay. Really simple mechanism. Um, in the 1970s in Britain, taxation on the wealthiest, on the, you know, the, the top, it, in some cases it came to 90% after a certain amount of money. Under Margaret Thatcher, Taxation was higher than it is now, and higher than Jeremy Corbyn, supposedly the rescuer of the new left, is proposing. Okay. Business rates for taxation under Margaret Thatcher were 33%. Now they're 25%. Corbyn is proposing they increase to 28%, and companies in Britain are saying if Corbyn gets elected, we'll leave. They didn't leave when Margaret Thatcher was in power. So, so, so I, I think we need to recognize that, there, that the, the social democratic state had all sorts of problems, but there were also many things the social democratic state did that anybody committed to equality would welcome and would want to, would want to reenact. But let's not, when we do that, let's not then say that the social democratic state that was the British state between 1945 and 1979 Let's not say it was democratic. Remember, this was a state that was at war for all but one year since 1945. Has been officially at war somewhere in the world. One year out of 60 or 70 years, the British Social Democratic State has been at war. Let's not forget that the Social Democratic Compromise depended upon the post-colonial settlement, which in effect ensured the extraction of resources from the rest of the world. So social democratic redistribution is at the same time premised upon the ability to extract resources from other parts of the world. This phone is, uses something called coltan. Coltan is extracted on the eastern uh, part of Zaire, the Congo, in mines which are basically run by warlords who sell the coltan onto international markets via Rwanda. So even as I sit in this room with this extraordinary capacity to communicate with anybody across the world, you know, communicative rationality, the basis of our democratic being together, the techniques of communication are themselves manifestly the, the um, expression of extraordinary levels of inequality. So, so, so yes, I want to welcome, celebrate those forms of redistribution. But I also want to recognize the extraordinary limits of those regimes, what they relied upon, the forms of labor extraction, 
the, the global relations that were established. The fact that British colonial history underpins British wealth today. Lloyds Bank, one of the greatest banks in Britain, it became a bank because of the selling of slaves. It exists as a bank today because the government paid to rescue us in 2008. It didn't pay to rescue the accounts of the individual account holders, it rescued the bank. Yeah? Democratic decision making, let's get rid of the bank and ensure that the people who had their money in the bank get their money back. Put the money elsewhere. You know, there were all sorts of things we could have done in 2008 that weren't done. So that's a long answer to, to, to a short question. Um, in terms of sim simulation, yes, of course. Democracy is always simulated. Um, when David Cameron came to power, he had this idea about localism. And the image he had was, he used to speak in romantic terms about this. He spoke about the cricket playing villagers who gather on Sunday afternoon and they sit on their green and they play cricket and they drink glasses of gin and tonic and they talk about how to run their village. And he imagined them cleaning up the streets and the bins and they no longer need services supplied by companies to come and clean the rubbish because they can set this up locally through you know, these local forms of democracy. Basically what he was justifying was cutting of central state resources. So, so yeah, simulation. Always. How do I pronounce your name? Oh, that's a tough one. Srijan. It's a... Uh... Srijan. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess that you answered most of my questions, except the Dewey one, so... Probably no. I'm not sure I can answer any questions about Dewey, so... Uh, but, no, no, but, but maybe a different twist on something that Olga and Mariano already said. I mean, you said that you had, have nothing against intersubjectivity, but you have something against collect, collective reasoning. Uh, that sounds we, like we, we need to just be careful about how we define intersubjectivity first. Yeah, because I, I, when you say uh, that demos, uh, that's a, a, at the start of the chapter, I'm quoting here, the demos does not require that all speak. And then later on you say, it can be invoked by anyone, anywhere, in the name of equality. Yeah. Well, I was wondering about some limits of, of, uh, regarding this qualification, uh, and, and this is something that Olga and Marian speak, speak about. When we introduce this, when this demos came, comes into being, and when it starts to make collective reason, then can another demos emerge from, it, from within it? And then another one within it, and then, and then another one within it, and then we have something which I personally have a problem with Serbian lab is that <laughs> probably in, during the course of this seminar we have like 30 fractions of Serbian lab emerged. You know, so the problem on the one side is policing the left, but the, on the other side there is also this uh, Achilles, uh, Achilles heel of, 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 of the left, which is fractionism. And, and, and the, on the other side, how do we, you know, organize and, and, and you know, uh, s sail to some safe waters regarding these two, two divergent and, and really, really big problems regarding the life. And now, something that you also said, when I ask you what, what are we going to do, when I say we, that means political philosophers, sociologists, social scientists, you said, well, I don't have yesterday, you said, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But, but I think that there is, a, you, you use, I didn't know that Gramsci is so uh, prominent in your research, but there is this idea of good sense in Gramsci. And, and uh, I think that maybe this kind of uh, in, uh, in, inherent in, uh, intersubjective potential critique could be used in, uh, to, to, you know, sort of find a way in between these two div divergent uh, uh, imperatives, that is, not to be policed and not to be, you know, turned into a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. So that, that would be the first two questions I'm giving up on the property of the market. <laughs> uh, and then 
about democracy uh, uh, and Dewey. Yeah. I mean, he literally says in, in democracy and education, and I know he is a liberal, but also there is some, I think that some of the stuff could be important for, 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 for your research. Yeah. At least when he speaks about contingency and its relation to democracy, he says, for example, in democracy and education, democracy is more than a form of government. Yeah, it is primarily associ associated with living, conjunct, communicated experience. It is a way of life. I like this symptom really, and it resonates good with something that you are saying. Uh, although in public in its reasons he says that democracy is a form of government, but yeah, that's so. Maybe maybe this idea of experimentation, of a way of life, of trying to avoid the quest of certainty, is perhaps something that can modify some some aspects of of this, you know inherent danger of the regime and still man maintain some basic intersubjectivity, some basic organizational potential that will avoid uh, fragmentation, that will avoid fractionism, etc. So, that was another question. Um, so, just on, on Dewey, um, this is probably the only Dewey text I do know. Um, uh, and it was in part because I was reading another article and somebody quoted this, what you've just read. Um, so I went back and I found the text. So it will probably find its way into, in, into my text. Um, and the, the, your description of this idea, I, 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 for good reasons, I have no objection to at all. Um, in terms of um, demos, um, I, I might, I'm going to say something which might seem... Um, slightly odd now. Um, we, and I'm using Ron Sears language because you use the language, but it's not the language I normally use. But we can't escape police orders. We live in police orders. Okay? Our lives are regimented in all sorts of ways. Um, there, there's, no, there's no way out of that. Um, so any form of democratic enactment always takes place within existing orders. Otherwise, we just live in some fairyland um, in which we, we think we can simply act. So I, I don't think that um, w and w one can escape them. But unlike um, Rancière, I do not think that everything that takes place in so-called police orders is undemocratic. And part of what takes place in police orders might... I don't like the word common sense, I, 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 because it's, it's, it's often... Uh, common sense can be dangerous, especially if it's Trumpist common sense. Um, when he, keep, he keeps using this phrase, Trump, yeah, if you have a look. Common sense and, is I, different I, from I, the good I, sense. So. Yeah, and, and good, uh, good, uh, even good sense I worry about slightly, but I'll come back to that. The, the, but I'll, let me try and be brief, because I know we're going to run out of time. The, um, the point about the policing of everyday lives is that we much of what we do is a practice of equality. So even in so-called police orders, there are all sorts of things we do every day in our interactions with each other, with each other, which are just, let's call them, commonsensical, daily practices of being together. Whether that be in the family or in the seminar room, or as we walk down the streets and we respect somebody walking past us, or we queue and we don't jump the queue in front of other people, just really stupid things. And we sometimes forget this that part of the practice of everyday life is this mutual respect um, in terms of practices, in terms of communication, in terms of interaction. Um, so so th that's where I find equality. Um, in, ter in terms of factionalism, um, I don't know, I'm, I, I, the word faction is immediately premised on the assumption that there's a possible unity. So when somebody uses the word faction, I, I, I get worried um, because it presupposes that, that this unity is, is somehow there. Um, and then I do get worried about policing and policing factions and order. Um, but that might just be because I've got such an aversion, uh, not an avaroist, avaroist position, but an aversion to, um, to, to the Marxist left. Um, Good sense, um, 
Well, if good sense is used in the way in which I've just described it, to talk about the everyday practices that sustain everyday life, I've got no problem with this. If good sense is invoked, as it often is, as a political tool to privilege some over others, um, or to privilege particular ways of being, then I, then I want to be a little bit more careful. I'm more interested in Gramsci's insistence that the distinction between state and civil society is much more fluid, that hegemony is constructed through a range of institutions, cultural, political, economic, etc. Um, but what I reject in Gramsci is the reference back to class, uh, which in the last instance, a little bit like Althusser, one always finds. I'm not sure I answered all the questions, but no, thank no. you. Okay, um, my first question is similar to Olga as Marian, but it's situated in a different literature, so uh, okay. I'm mostly yes, focused on one of your biggest footnotes in the beginning of the chapter. So it's about the boundary problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you say that, so I quote you, 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 you asked the question, what if the boundary problem indicates a fundamental misunderstanding of democracy if it is generated by the presupposition that democracy is a regime? So I have to say I, I read a fair share of boundary problem literature and I completely share the concern about yeah. most of the democrat theorists writing about boundary problem. I think it's something very wrong and misleading, uh, but not in just the fact that they tackle boundary problem, but the way one to resolve the solve yeah. the boundary problem. So the I, invocation I fully, of a principle. Yeah, so I, I fully agree with that. Um, but I want to just uh, say that there are now some new authors um, who try to read boundary problem in a more similar way than that you do, yeah. but they admit the need to have bounds, which I think that yeah. you somehow evade this issue. Um, so, which authors uh, are you thinking of? Well, for instance, uh, there is, I think, uh, there is uh, Matt Wheat, I don't know who he is, but he uh, uh, published a paper in Constellations, I can send it to you, and he divides, uh, for instance, strategies of closing uh, the b bounds, which is most of uh, democratic boundary theorists are doing. Um, so they close, they give you a principle and they close the issue, and then say there is a strategy of contestation, and that's where actually agonists are. I, I wrote a thesis about that, trying to think about boundary problem from this agonistic perspective, so th as a transgression of boundaries. Yeah. Um, so um, I think that, of course, the problem is that when the more agonistic, uh, but not just agonistic authors, think about boundary problem, they don't want to solve it. They just uh, think about it as a democratic paradox. Yeah. Chantal Mufa is the, yeah. one of the authors doing that. Bonnie Honig as well, also very much. Bill Connolly. Uh, yes, but uh, Honig uh, massively influenced by Ryan Sierre when yeah. writing Democracy and the Foreigner. Uh, so, uh, but I think I also gained something from reading all this misled literature yeah. about the boundary problems in thinking about these different principles and what they say to us. And I also found not in a such systematic way some of these principles in the literature of agonistic democracy. Yeah, so for instance, right. I think that, um, and that's where similarity with Marian's question is. So I think that for instance, all subjective principle, uh, it doesn't, uh, I mean, it says- Sorry, I didn't get that. The all, subject, all subjective principle, okay, that yeah, people who should be included yeah. that are yeah. those who are subjected yeah. to the structures of domination. Yeah. So these, actually the structures of the domination, they constitute the initial set of yeah. people who belong to demos and who should in a way emerge actively enacting equality or trying to democratize these yeah. very structures of domination. Of course, they're always one step too late, yeah. but I mean, this is, this is the, the struggle there. Um, so in that sense, I mean, I don't think that um, the problem is, I don't think it's uh, completely true to say the boundary problem itself is necessarily linked with understanding that democracy is a regime. Mm -hmm. But that, of course, majority of theorists did that, but that you can't evade boundary problem. Uh, whenever you think about enacting, uh, constituting political subject, 
the boundary problem emerges every single day. You know, of course, in ordinary things, but also in, in extraordinary moments of, of enacting democracy. Um, so maybe this is not, I mean, this is directly in your chapter, I would say, linked to how you understand demos. And I mean, I somewhat also um, have issue with that because, as Sergian asked, to me, then it sounds that you equate too easily democracy with equality, and then demos can be very little an individual, but it can be everything, you know, all people in the world. So it catches too much and too little. And in somehow, I don't even think that it's really coherent, uh, or maybe, I don't know, I'm just posing this as a question, that it's even coherent with your uh, uh, description of this ordinary moments when we enact equality. Um, because, uh, I mean, to, now to link that with the, the, with the issue of equality and then antagonism. So with equality, you know, in our everyday moments we enact equality, but many of this is not really improper politics. No, of course not. Yeah. I mean, it's not defined anyway, but it's, it's proper because it's not defined, it's left to us, yeah. so it's not improper. But it's enactment of equality, so it's not democracy. So I think there is some kind of a need to make a distinction between equality and democracy. Yeah. And uh, the mm -hmm. issue about antagonism is, uh, I'm not, I mean, it also depends how you understand antagonism and agonism. So at one point you say democratic politics is thus antagonistic, not agonistic or deliberative. Democracy is not an existing order, but the processes through which such order is challenged. This is the way I read agonism as well. I mean, there yeah, it's yeah. just the continuum how the challenge is understood. What is the challenge? You know, uh, and even I think you can find passages at Ranciere to support this. For instance, when he says democratic, the political emerges when you conflict police with politics. Yeah. And police is always the first. The order yeah. is the first, regime is the first. And then you constitute uh, basically the community of the vision when you have this collision between those who have part and those who do not have part. And even in, at that moment you have some, something that is somewhat local. Proximity of those who are in conflict, they are emerging demos. So to me there, there are some bounds to that. They are not you know, officially entrenched, fixed, but there, there are some boundaries at, at, at a particular moment of enactment of equality. Um, so I'm not, I'm sure, I mean, you could say that this is antagonistic, but if it's everyday practice of enactment of equality, doesn't have to be antagonistic. So I think maybe you need some clarification. But I mean, of course, democracy is linked to equality, but mm -hmm. in what way? There, there should be some uh, addition to that. And uh, the second thing um, is about what is proper and what is improper. So, for instance, I would link that to your talk yesterday about. Um, right-wing populism, for instance. So let's say, if is political correctness proper? Is racism or sexism proper? Or is anti-racism and anti-sexism proper? That depends how we understand this proprietary regime. So do they, what they formally claim they represent, and they always say, at least liberal democracies say that we are based on equality and liberty. Is this really what is proper or something underlying the structure that we know it's based on violence and racism, yeah. sexism? So what is proper? And uh, actually more important question is, uh, so how do we recognize what would then be improper politics and which of this would be um, democratic? Because I, I could imagine there are conflicts about what is improper, different versions of improper, mm -hmm. and also different versions of proprietary regimes, you know, let's say capitalist or communist, so also different uh, structures of behavior de depending on the, this type of pro property. So would those fighting socialist or communist regime necessarily be fighting as a Democrats to the proprietary regime? Yeah. Um, and I now also want to link this with, um, I mean, this is exactly the, you know, the, the tension that we always have when we try to find some way to distinguish what is our politics and what is not, and then we might enter into policing, as you, as you say. But at the same time, I worry that if we don't do that, we, what, we don't really know what we are, uh, we might, be, might have difficulty to explain what is that we are claiming. Um, so for instance, 
the um, the example that you gave uh, at the beginning of the chapter with the uh, homeless women yeah. uh, behaving improperly in defending their uh, well in a way also their property they had houses that yeah. be, you know be uh, that are outside the bounds of the proper property but still you know they defended their houses but you selected this example, you know, and I think most of the Democrats would select simpler, uh, similar examples. So there is some principle behind the selection of these type of examples, you know, mm -hmm. some version of some content of equality that you defend, even though in the chapter it's somehow negative. It's always as a transgression, not the definition of, of the uh, elaboration of the content of equality. Um, but even Ed Rancière, I mean, he doesn't say that it's explicitly, but this is how I read his examples uh, when he also go, goes back to um, ancient uh, examples of democracy. Rome, yeah. uh, when he talks, for instance, about the uh, succession of Roman plebs at Avantin Hill, uh, in comparison to the riots of the Skeet's uh, slaves. Yeah. So the, the right of the skid slaves failed because they themselves didn't believe they're equal and the uh, secession of Roman plebs succeeded because they believed they were yeah. equal. But it's not just that they believed, they were they recognized yeah. by Senate. Yeah. So yeah. I see somehow similarity with what you yesterday you said, you know, in La Claus you have demands and here you have enactments, but still when you enact equality you still need a recognition by someone. Um, and that's, I don't know, um, this recognition worries me very much, but it's always there somehow, and mm. that's why I think we also need, I don't know if we need a principle, but just we have to be aware that uh, we also do some kind of um, selection of examples, selection of cases that we think are enactments of equality. We recognize some as enactments of equality and some we, we don't. Thank you. Okay. So, Thank you. Um, the, I'm not sure I can answer all, but I, but I, I will try. Um, the, the boundary problem. Um, I, this, so, so a slightly, if you forgive me, a slightly complex answer to this. Um, I think in democratic theory, so not political theory, but in democratic theory, the boundary problem only emerges because one asks the question about how it is we should find a principle to bound the demos on the assumption that the demos is a regime. So I think we both agree about that. And that would, if, if we agree about that, then further interventions are in effect make the same presupposition if they work within these bounds. So the all affected interest principle is actually a different, and this I think there's a confusion in the literature, because I've, I've, the, the all affected interest principle is something that goes back to Dahl, um, originally from 1971, I think, or 1970. But, but that principle doesn't have to be tied to a boundary question. Not in the same way. Because all affected interests the boundaries shift and change depending on what the issues are, how the matters resolved. Whereas the boundary problem originally is concerns who counts as part of the demos. So what you guess in the boundary literature is a kind of shifting terrain in which you begin with this question of boundaries. There's a recognition that you can't resolve this question using democracy as the starting point, so you invoke other principles. Those other principles then shift you onto a different terrain which is no longer actually about um, bounding the demos. It's about how different, and, and this is actually quite close to some of what I've argued, it's about how a demos is constituted in relation to different issues where you have different um, groups or, or different people who claim to enact a politics of equality. So, so I think there's some overlap between the argument I want to make and the people who are at the very edges of the, um, of the boundary theory debate. But, but what I would say is they're not really dealing with boundaries anymore. They've actually somewhat ironically moved beyond where they started. And I would want to f push them 
beyond the limits that they presuppose or the debate they think they're, they're intervening in. Um, one of the people whose work I really like is, uh, now I don't know why his name's escaped me now, that this theorist of representative democracy, um, the English theorist, um, on who, who makes the, the idea of representative claims, which Lisa Dish has developed. And it's, who's Urbinat? the other guy? Um, Urbinat? No, I, I really dislike Urbanati's yeah, work, I, but I um, Lisa Dish, Urbanati, Mark, um, it's a really wonderful book where he speaks about representative claim making. And he says that representative claim making is the establishment of those who are represented in the making of the claim. But that claim making goes way beyond the boundaries of states. So he begins to rethink democracy in terms of representative claim making rather than in terms of regimes. And he thus rethinks representative democracy in a way completely contrary to what uh, uh, um, Nadia Urbanati does. Um, her book, Democracy Disfigured, is, it, it really plagued me. Um, but, but that's a, a different matter. Um, he, he rethinks democracy within the representative tradition. Um, I'll, I'll send you the reference as well. Um, the, as going beyond the idea of representation in the liberal representational form. Um, so this, I'm interested in these, these types of theorists who, who are on the edges of the boundary problem, but in addressing the problem begin to think about constituencies that go way beyond the traditional boundaries um, of, of what takes to be the demos. Now, I'm not sure that completely answers the question, but, but basically I'm saying yes, I agree with you, that on the edges of this debate there is something much closer to, to what I would want to work with. Um, Equality not equivalent to democracy. Okay, so let me just be blunt here. Okay, really blunt. This is partly a political intervention, um, in that for decades we've been told that democracy is about liberty. Um, I think democracy is about equal liberty, um, and I want to insist upon equality as the starting point, because the literature, certainly the political theory literature for the most part, um, focuses on the question of liberty first and has done for a long time, for too long. In the same way, in insisting on going back to property, I want to return to some debates which have been marginalized. So this, in part, in part, I'm making a political decision about what I emphasize in the writing of the text. Um, but linked to this, though, is two things. Um, I insist that everybody is equal. And if somebody says that I'm wrong, then my response to them is, well, we disagree. Um, I'm not prepared to argue about equality, in other words. Now, you might say that's not democratic, to go back to your question, are these two things distinct? And here I'm reasonably close to Alain Badiou's insistence that politics insists upon an axiomatic equality as the starting point. A bit like axioms in mathematics, where the axioms cannot be disproven, but they have to be the basis of any mathematical system, otherwise the system no longer holds. I think in politics we should begin with equality. Um, that's my starting assumption. And I, it's not that I can prove that, it's not that I'm going to get some, if somebody says to me, prove it, it's a bit like someone saying to David Hume, prove the existence of God. Um, and, and Hume, I mean, he's, all, he's always read as the person who says, oh, you can't do these things. But Hume's response very straightforwardly is, you, I can't prove your belief. Okay? If you believe in God, that's fine. But you can't, I can't prove and you can't prove that God exists. So I'm not going to try and convince people that equality is what is the case. But for me, what's more difficult, my response will be, demonstrate to me that inequality is natural. And what's interesting about that is inequality has to be justified. Equality doesn't require justification. So I rather begin with what I think doesn't need justification. But then what follows from that, so for me, whoever asks that question, I want to say, okay, tell me why inequality is the case. Not as an empirical description of the world, but why I should begin with the assumption that human beings are unequal. I think that's a mad assumption to begin with. 
And anyone who begins with that, you know, we're not sitting at the same table. Um, what that means as well, however, is that um, I think there's an intrinsic relationship between equality and democracy. Um, equality does not have to be about the enactment of democracy. Okay? It's not that the two are exactly the same. Democracy isn't an axiom. But I think in order for equality to be realized, its realization requires the enactment of practices in which, to go back to the language you used, which is too analytical for my liking, but nonetheless, all affected interests, in some sense, can participate, can have a say. But there's one last qualification. Um, and I'm sorry this is such a long answer. If um, I gave an example which is slightly weird, where I said democracy may be enacted in the private household. Um, now, we all know that the family has been a site of inequality for generations, for hundreds of years. Um, we all know the history of the relationship. You know, it, until 1989 in British law, it was deemed impossible for a man to rape his wife because sex was deemed to be a property that was required in marriage. This is until 1989 um, in law. It's quite extraordinary. Um, the, the, the point about enacting democracy or equality in, for example, the family, is that in insisting upon being treated equally, somebody is also insisting that everybody else in that position must be treated in the same way. So the enactment of equality, even if it's done by an individual, and John Stuart Mill, somebody I dislike in many respects, but his point about liberty is very straightforward, that no matter what the utilitarian calculus is, the voice of one person cannot be closed down, because sometimes it's the voice of the one person that is in fact representative of what might be a politics of equality. So, so, so I, 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 I don't want demos to be reducible to number, to go back to the reading of, um, of Josiah Ober. And if demos is no longer restricted to number, then it's possible that demos can be enacted um, by one, by none, by many. Um, but this will depend on different circumstances. Um, there was one last question you asked me about the proper and the improper, about what is proper. The reason why I don't want to insist on what is proper is not because I don't think that some things are, are wrong. Um, I want to insist that equality is improper because the one thing that doesn't exist, has never existed, is equality. So enacting or insisting upon e equality is always in some sense improper. Um, even existing orders which have some forms of equality built into them, the enactment of equality would undermine those orders. So I want to hold on to the possibility of equality as not ever being realized, but always as being improper in relation to existing forms of order. Um. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to all the first five. It's gone on for a long time, thank you. Um, I, uh, yes, but I just, can I just propose that we have a 15 minutes break maybe now. Okay, let's let's continue with the seminar and um, I think I will reschedule a little bit. So first we'll be having maybe uh, Alexander Kovalovich who's going to talk about the numbers because we mentioned numbers and uh, maybe we could then continue with the potential limits of the people and the problem of the number. Uh, then we have then to have uh, Milena Fickett, who's going to um, link her own contribution to what Milena Djordjevic was saying about the empirical implication of these assumptions. Um, then to have Judith Nagridge, who's going to ask something about time, property, and democratic politics. And then Igor Zvej with certain problem politics within democracy and a comment about the foreign and politics laws and to <laughs> end with me and some of the very insignificant questions that I would ask. Okay, so um, the first one on Sunday. Thank you.
uh, reading is a personal experience, and I want to make first uh, like a few personal advice. Sure. Every so often, and I think more and more often, I read something that I don't know why it has been written. You know, like something that hardly has any claims, that is maybe elegant, that is, uh, you know, scholarly okay, but you don't, you don't see a real purpose. It can be a theoretical work, it can be a novel, it can be... And I'm glad that, and I'm grateful that we had this, we had this opportunity to engage with this text, because it's precisely the opposite of that, you know. <laughs> it's bold and it's Thank very you. individual. And I think that should be said. Uh, Thank you. Uh, nice. And I also want to make another remark regarding the style. You know, it has something of a prophetic discourse, I would say, with these stories that open every chapter. And, you know, almost like parables in, in, in <laughs> biblical discourse. So if you want to be a messiah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, decent rhetorical strategy. But also, sentences are short and they resonate. And while I don't think per se that uh, clarity is uh, always a virtue, I, you know, I, I don't know how Lacan would sound if actually his sentences had any, any sense, you know. So it, <laughs> But I believe that a book where the people are the fundamental concept, I think such a book profits when it's written by a style that is uh, accessible, you know, that looks like it has been written maybe for the people or by the people. And where almost every paragraph, even though we are engaging constantly with, with uh, <coughs> fundamental concepts, almost every paragraph can be taken, uh, you know, put on a blog or in Guardian or something like that. Not every, but, you know, that, that, that was. So this is like uh, what I would call, uh, because this is work in progress, I'm talking as a reader. This is what uh, I, don't, I think maybe Hume would say, like a appropriately inclined reader or benevolent <laughs> reader would call it. So good camp. Now, because it's a work in progress, what, what use is of me being just a good cop? So what, you know, what would a bad cop say? You know, that was my question. And uh, I will say a few sentences here. I'm focusing on the statement that democracy is not a regime. And basically, it seems to me in this chapter, your argumentation is based on your reading of uh, Athenian demos and about the lack of institutions, the lack of constitution, the lack of, of regime that existed in the origins of uh, democratic uh, there I cannot use the word the regime, but the origin <laughs> of the word is demos and uh, demos and krate, right? Yeah. Uh, one issue that it seems to me maybe deserves some clarification is this: the potential limitlessness or, or un unlimitedness of, of the people. You argue that there is this element in the origins of uh, Athenian demos, in the concept itself, yes. and you invoke Aristotle, I think, on two occasions within this chapter. Uh, it may sound maybe a little bit reductive or that you are only referring to this, to those elements that in a way serve your goal. <coughs> and I prepared here like a few sentences from, from the politics. Uh, one is, uh, a great city, says Aristotle, is not to be confounded with the populous one. Uh, since all cities which have a reputation for good government have a limit of, of population. We may argue on grounds of reason and the same result will follow. For law is order and good law is good order. But a very great multitude cannot be orderly. And then it goes on and he concludes with a statement. A state then only begins to exist when it has attained the population sufficient for a good life in the political community. It may indeed, if it somewhat exceeded this number, be a greater state. But, as I was saying, there must be a limit. And it seems to me that this question of uh, limiting, so citizens, they can be, you know, it's very hard to distinguish who can be, and we can say on the one hand that anyone can be a citizen or expand this notion. On the other hand, it seems to me that Aristotle and, and the ancient thinkers were pretty much concerned of, you know, how, you know, how to delineate, how to limit it. And maybe, it, you know, it would be, I don't know, um, maybe fairer if, if, Mm -hmm. We make a reference to that as well. Uh, and maybe because this is very long, I might stop here and at some point I might send you another paragraph. Um, okay, so let, let me speak 
just a little bit about the, the Politeia and the reference to Aristotle. Um, the, my, my reading of the Politeia, so if we go back to book one of the politics where Aristotle's trying to talk about um, the state and he then proceeds to distinguish different types of regime of which democracy is one type of regime. So, so if we're being fair, as you've just said, Aristotle begins, assumes that democracy is a regime, but he assumes it's a regime which is not good. Um, he, he doesn't condemn democracy. He defends um, a form of politeia, which has aspects of democracy, aspects, you know, the, 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 the golden mean, which has aspects of um, monarchical, aristocratic, and um, democratic elements. So, so this is, broadly speaking, Aristotle's position. However, the, if you look at the quote that I used from Aristotle, um, I selected, and you're absolutely right, um, every text makes the selections that serve their argument. But, um, and maybe I need to refer to, the, to this backdrop that Aristotle is defending regime and limits. But in the section where he compares the principles that underpin democracy as opposed to aristocracy. The distinction that he draws is that um, an arist aristocratic regime is based upon wealth and a democratic regime is based on no property. So what I'm playing with, and this goes back to um, somebody you referred to, back to Roncia's reading and the very opening pages of disagreement, where what, Ar what Aristotle tries to unpick it's not Aristotle, what Rancière tries to unpick in his reading of Aristotle and Plato and a number of other Greek theorists is that the problem they have is that democracy is irreducible to a regime because they can't find a principle, unlike um, oligarchy and unlike um, monarchy, um, they cannot find a principle that distinguishes this regime in the same way. Um, and for that reason, when Aristotle goes on to speak about um, how one draws limits, he says you have to draw limits, but he doesn't give us a principle for drawing limits. The only principle is that in order to enact a regime, we require limits. But of course the regime he's speaking about is a politeia. It's not a democracy. So democracy is, it, it's, a, it's odd in Aristotle because it, it kind of fits the six regime types, but it's the one that doesn't quite fit. It unsettles the others. And this is a reading which I find very um, persuasive, which um, is then developed by, um, by Jacques Rancière in a particular way. And in this respect, I'm relying on, on that particular reading of Rancière. The reason why I did it through Desire Ober, who is the, uh, uh, the British or Amer British American scholar, um, who works on um, democracy, at, at ancient democracy, is that Ober pinpoints this problem of number initially, and he pinpoints the problem of power, kratos. Where is the proper place for the exercise of this power? Um, so his reading allows me to, to, to make a different argument about democracy. So, first response, yes, I should acknowledge that, of course, the Greek theorists assume that the demos is constituted by citizens, that citizens are male, that women are not, cannot be citizens, cannot be property owners, that slaves are owned but cannot be property owners, um, that it's a regime. And my point would be that what we call the Athenian democracy is in fact not a democracy. Um, so that one of the faults with political theory, I think, is when we, to go back to the story of democracy that we tell. This is a story which says democracy originates in Athens. This was the first democracy. Oh, there were some problems with it. You know, no woman, no slaves, etc. Uh, but nonetheless, it's the first democracy because we had the assembly, we had the, um, the circulation of um, who acted as archon, um, you know, who, who, who every, so every day of the year there was a different member of the, of the assembly who would be the ruler of Athens for a day. So some incredible institutional things. The exercise of a lot, which we've forgotten. You know the lots, the lottery system, which, which the only way our modern democracies preserve 
the lottery is in the national lottery where, where you can buy a lottery ticket to win lots of money. Um, but imagine a democracy which was like a lottery, in which anyone, no matter who they were, could be picked to rule. So there's some extraordinary things that we do find in this system. But I think for Aristotle, democracy is a problem. I think, if, I think it doesn't quite fit the regime. And when he speaks about this, he says, democracy is the government of the poor. And then he says, democracy is, is the government of those who have no property. Those are, those are the two descriptions that he uses to describe democracy. Um, uh, and then he also says that democracy is premised on equality. So we get this, this contradiction. Equality, to go back to what you said and someone else said earlier, equality has to be all-inclusive, but democracy is the rule of the poor. So how do you put these two together, the rule of the poor and equality? And I think Rancia plays on that contradiction. Um, in terms of limit and number, um, all I would say is that um, I don't think there can be limits to democracy unless you presuppose it's a regime. And one of the reasons there can't be a limit to democracy is we will all die. And we have this problem which Edmund Burke picks up, where Burke says the prejudice of previous generations should place limits on what the next generations do. And the reason Burke suggests this is because he thinks people have learned historically what to do. So there is this great prejudice of history. And his worry about the French Revolution is the French Revolution overthrows the prejudice of history. But the point is, of course, we shouldn't be vain. Human beings are vain. Um, but you know, what we say today, what we decide today, tomorrow will be overturned. Um, tomorrow will be rejected. And I think democracy has something of that anarchic moment, which is disordering rather than ordering. Um, and in that, if you want to play games with numbers and mathematics, um, I don't like Alain Badiou's work that much, but I do love his account of um, infinity, where he describes in mathematical terms the necessity of an infinity of infinities. If there was only one infinity, then the infinity has limits. But an infinity of infinities places you in a world similar to Spinoza's ethics, um, where the placing limits on a regime is in effect to undermine possibility. So I would link democracy to possibility and potentiality as well. Um, if, we, if we want to go back to Aristotle, to, the, um, to his accounts, of um, being where he speaks about the distinction between um, potentiality and what is the case. And I think at some point he says something along the lines of what's proper to the human is potentiality. Um, I, I kind of accept this. Um, but a potentiality which isn't based upon a prior notion of what it is to be. Um, so it's not quite an answer, but, 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 but I, I agree with you. I have overemphasized certain moments for, for theoretical reasons, um, but but this is a um, it actually strengthens my argument if I can just show that democracy is the regime which is not a regime, in the way in which Aristotle describes the other regimes. And it's now clear to me what, what uh, all the connections are. And basically you said in the, the, the intervention before the, we have a break uh, that uh, you somehow uh, want to emphasize the importance of the concept of equality for democracy. That we can, this is the basic thing. We cannot lose from our mind this concept of equality and how this is important, how this is constitutive of democracy. And, every form of democracy we call, as we call it now, democratic systems, are not democratic uh, uh, because they are not actually uh, answering to this uh, quest for equality. Uh, but then I have, uh, and I don't, I don't actually see uh, so much difference between this and what the deliberative theory is focusing on, 
especially in the last 10 years with this systemic approach where they're trying to actually integrate all the voices and agonistic democracy so inside. We, we, which theorists are you uh, thinking? Systemic approach to deliberative theory. With which theorists in particular? Um, I, I, the first book, like book, uh, is I think in 2012, Mainsbridge and Parkinson. And the, this is the, like the main book that the other then uh, are using. In the, uh, they're trying, they're uh, actually at the stage of working theory. And this is what I really appreciate because they're trying to approach even empirical research and to give the answers to those uh, like m institutional mechanism uh, what are pro that are proposed from the side of political elites, how to correct democracy and from the side of uh, empirical researchers. Uh, in that sense, I don't see uh, how deliberative, when you're criticizing democratic theory, I, I don't see how this is different from uh, this critique is different from the critique of deliberative theory as it is now, of course. We start is this with, Jane Mainsbridge? Uh, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, and then, I c of course, I share your worries that we are not uh, uh, satisfying in, in correct way this principle of equality in democratic systems now. But still, I'm wondering what would be uh, the way we can uh, approach the question of practical uh, implementation of the principle of equality uh, yeah, in the real world politics, uh, especially if you, like I can give some examples as you did, but uh, I will try to, to put it on the other levels. Uh, this, this, this can be, this can remain like this uh, insisting of uh, concept of equality remain corrective principle, or we can try as deliberative theorists now try to put it into some kind of practices. But then it remains still the question always remains open: who are excluded? Somebody, somebody is always excluded, yeah, exactly. and this is what empirical science is telling us and reflection of all these mechanisms that they are inventing for the last 20 years to include everybody. Uh, I will give an extreme example of this. What can we do? Uh, how can we include all? Like, as you said, all affected interests, which is the formulation I, I prefer also. Yeah. Uh, when we speak about environmental politics, what about future generations? Yeah. How, how can we include future generations? How can we decide in the name of the future generation? Who, who will help us to do that? And how we can then limit the approach, the critique of exclusion? We, we necessarily exclude them. And this is not democratic. So you're basically uh, saying that there is no possible, possible way to practice democracy like if we want to respect the principle of inclusion. Um, and then there's some minor. Uh, I, I want your reflection on that, that basically, and how this, uh, your uh, reflection on democracy differentiates uh, from deliberative, especially this new way of systemic deliberative theory. And then uh, your, this question of property, I, I, I learned from the, the discussion, I understand it better, but then still uh, remain open for me, like property is, uh, what came to my mind with property is, for, for example, an important issue to the right to the city movements. It's, it's their basic question. They, they question the, the property rights and mm -hmm. who, who should be owner and who have the rights to property. And uh, how this connect with what you say that nobody, that today nobody is concerned with property when we have like 30 years of this uh, city, right to the city movements who are taken in consideration, especially by deliberative theory, but I also think agonistic, the democratic theory. So this is, I think, other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, so, um, in terms of deliberative democracy, one of the, the founding texts in deliberative democracy is Factus Itat und Geltum. Um, from translated in 96, I think in German in 94. Um, and in this text, Habermas makes a very basic argument, which is that sovereignty and rights are co-original. They presuppose each other. 
But what's really interesting about the way in which he formulates this in, I think, in chapter six of the book, when he's talking about rights, he describes what he takes to be the primary rights, which are constitutive of the possibility of deliberation. And these include things like free speech, the right to participate, etc. And he then speaks about a set of secondary rights, and included amongst the secondary rights, which are not primary, are things like wealth, distribution, and property. But it's two or three sentences, and there's no mention whatsoever of the politics of property. What you then get in deliberative democracy, and I, I don't know Jane's, I, mean, I don't know this book, I know the book, I know the work that where she's dealing with um, the representative turn, um, contemporary represent, the contemporary representative turn. I know that quite well, I don't know this text. But what you then get in deliberative democracy is a decade of work, two decades of work, after Habermas's text, um, with people like Cohen, with some of the American um, writers, where basically property is not an issue. What they're concerned about is the forms of deliberation that can be extended in order to get people to participate more. So you get James Fishkin's work, for example. You get all the assemblies, the various forms of town gatherings, <coughs> the halls, etc. Um, <coughs> The, so my response to that literature, and I'll come back to, to what you've just said in a moment, my response to that literature is to say, well, the, the starting point for any possibility of deliberative equality is a minimal material equality, which ensures that all can participate. And there, is an, there has been, and maybe Jane Mansbridge is different, there has been an underemphasis in the literature on this question of the basic equality that's required in order for those forms of participation to take place. Um, which I think originates in the way in which Habermas had formulated these arguments um, and the way they were then picked up by his American counterparts and developed from there. There is one thing, however, just go back to the empirical material you referred to with regard to Jane Mansbridge. There is one thing I really like in Habermas's work, this idea of a reconstructive science. Um, when Habermas talks about um, communicative rationality, one of the things he says, um, talking about knowledge, he says, how is it that we can reach some type of consensus about what is the case and what is not the case? And he insists upon a methodological approach which is plural, which is reconstructive, and which what he says reconstructs what is the best possible knowledge that we have using all forms of possible testing. So there's always the possibility of the counterintuitive testing of, the, of what has come to be accepted as knowledge. Now this approach combines both theoretical reflection but also what you've talked about, the empirical forms of research into the types of deliberation that do take place, the types of decision-making procedures. Um, so it allow, what, what he allows for is this, a, re, a, a reconstructive approach to knowledge which he calls, um, he, he calls this quasi-transcendental, um, which, which I quite like, but I, I have some problems with. Um, but, but, but anyway, this, the, 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 I, I, I agree with that approach. I don't know the systemic deliberates of Democrats. I don't know the extent to which they've begun to address questions of property. And I don't know the extent to which they've begun to say that if you presuppose equality, what are the basic preconditions in order for this equality even to begin to be enacted? Um, so that's the question I would want to put to, to you, but I'll go and have a look at the text and I'll, I'll see to the extent to which this is the case. Um, the, in terms of the principle of inclusion, Habermas also published a book, which I really dislike, called The Inclusion of the Other. Um, and one of the points about the improper is that the other can never finally be included. That any politics of inclusion always runs up against a fault line, an impossibility, which makes that inclusion impossible. And this goes back to the way Habermas reconstructs the idea of communicative rationality, which, which Honneth then corrects, actually, and Albert Wellmer as well intervenes in the debate and corrects. Habermas assumes that what underlies communication is the possibility of some type of um, what he initially called an ideal speech situation. 
um, which he later sort of undermines. But, but, but what Honneth points to is that the achievement of such an ideal would be the moment at which communication comes to an end. So ironically, the improper moment of this logic of rationality, the moment which holds together the whole edifice that underpins the deliberative de democratic intervention, relies upon a recognition of an impropriety which undermines the possibility, because at this point communication no longer takes place. You have an impossible unity. So Habermas, I think, has acknowledged this in his later work, but, but hasn't reconstructed the theoretical foundations as a consequence. And he's too old now, and he lives beside the Pope, so um, um, the next door neighbors, him and the ex-Pope. Uh, and they've had lots of lovely debates, which is a bit worrying. Um, but anyway, um, so, so this principle of inclusion I worry about. Okay, the idea of, of, of an absolute inclusion um, and, and what that means for deliberative Democrats. Um, the last, I mean, you spoke about the right to city and environmental politics. The problem of future generations is, is absolutely, I mean, every day new people are being born who are going to be affected by the decisions we make. And when we go, there will be other people who are born. And the environment is, I haven't spoken about it in this book. Um, but it's, it's absolutely central to any thinking of a future democratic politics that we have to imagine a future in which we will not be here, in which others can live. So, so, so what's interesting about the principle of equality is it extends beyond existing communities. And one of the reasons I like the idea of equality is it always raises the counterfactual possibility of those others who are not here, or those others who are not included, or those others who have not yet even been conceived of or conceptualized, in, and the link between birth and conceptualization is, I think, interesting, conception and conceptualizing. Um, but, but I think a politics of equality has to come to terms with this, which is another reason why I would insist on the improper. Um, on recognizing that what we take to be properly democratic for us now may destroy the possible worlds in future. I made a brief reference to this when I talked about the Mapuche peoples yesterday. I don't think um, you were here. The example I gave is from um, the national populisms of Argentina, in which the Mapuche people <coughs> went to Cristina de Kirchner and said, representatives of the Mapuches, went to her and said, look, you can't um, take oil from this part of the country in Patagonia. These are our lands. And her response essentially was, um, we need to develop equality for all, and that means we need to use the resources we have, and if we have to move you from your land, that's what we will do, but we will give you equivalent land. And of course the Mapuche response is, we have a relationship to this land, to these landmarks, to this hill, to this place. You can't simply come and take our oil. But the Mapuche also make the point that the land is something that they pass between the generations. So their idea of destroying land is based upon their notion of what the land is, is a completely different epistemological frame. It sees the world differently to those discourses of development. And I think we have something to learn from those other epistemologies um, which question the idea that democracy has to be based on increased resource extraction in order to ensure that people can live well. Um, so so I, I've hinted towards this, but it's not the topic um, of the book. Um, this, the right to the city movement, yes, of course, but when I say property is not being considered, I'm thinking primarily of political theorists after the early 1990s. Um, there is some return to a politics of property that's taken place in the last four or five years. Uh, and in legal scholarship, actually, Property was always there. Um, so, thank you. Uh, well, first I'd like to thank you for an inspiring text. It's truly refreshing and it gives us a lot to discuss about and think. So, I would like to open up a discussion to something that is latent in your text and yet it is not there. It might be sort of a subtext to a text. Uh, and this is the question between relation between time property and democratic politics. So you can think about it or not, reject it or whatever you want, but I'm just curious to hear what you think about it. 
So time, since the beginning of colonial times in Latin America, and I'm going back to colonial times in Latin America, first of all, because there is a, the illusion that colonial times are over, they're not. No. Post-colonial is historiographic category, it's not yet historic category, so there hasn't been actually kind of a radical break with it. The second reason for going to Latin America is because it is a breaking point in Western modernity. And you gave me a third reason to talk about Western modernity because, so the West is not a racist joke, it actually appears with Columbus um, in, the, in the, you know, the end of 15th, the beginning of 16th century. So the West in Latin America is pretty real hegemonic force. Yeah. I mean, it is a fiction, it is a powerful fiction, but I think that it's still, it played a really big role because West <coughs> goes to Latin America to find itself, and it goes to, to Latin America to find itself limitless. So there is still the question of limits there, which is a problem. So time has been turned into possession in Latin America. The here and now, the present, has been frozen through the production and reproduction where West appropriates the other for its own wealth. So time then is not the contingent force that marks the limit of property, subjectivity, sovereignty, and power, but is itself a property. In other words, if the West can govern or take time as it chooses, it is the master or owner of that temporality, the master itself. So on psychoanalytical level, what you have is the incorporation of incorporation. So the way you envision democracy as a day-to-day -day struggle is fine, but it seems to me that we are yet to think of adequate practices and tools that would deprivatize time, because, and this is on the trace of Ranciere's thought, I don't think that interruption and interval are sufficient to prevent time from being mastered. So the modest proposal would be this, that emancipation from possession of time would then be a construction of time of equality within the time of equality, inequality. Sorry, can you say that again? So the emancipation from possession of time yeah. would be then the construction of time of e equality within the time of inequality. But it would mean this, a way of putting several times into the same time and living in several times at once. So the, what? <laughs> well, so, right, so this is the question, I mean, so the, is it the question of imagination, but this, this is the question that literature has dealt with, not only Borges, it's there with Kafka, it's with Virginia Woolf, Fernando Pessoa, Alejandro Pisarnik, but Paul Deman as well, so it is a question of knowledge and capabilities. Mm -hmm. And I think that those who disavow this possibility also disavow the possibility of overcoming melancholic headaches, but I'm not going to get into melancholia now. So, so this brings me to the following insight, that the time of struggle, of day-to-day -day struggle, needs to be heterogeneized since we risk falling back into the traps of historicism, whether it's radical or new, it makes no difference, because it suggests a confrontation of two times, that of linear time, traditionally termed as man's time, or circular time, traditionally termed as women's time. So in more political terms, traditionally time as teleological fulfillment or time as redemption. So this brings me back to my question. So my question would be, what is the time of Demas? Would the time of Demas be a time of absence of time, a time which would no longer be formalized or sort of formless time? Which consequently, it would be a time that would not be possible to discipline or master. And then this would mean, and this is the provocative claim, that it would be politics grounded in alterity and no longer identity difference dialectic. It, it grounded in alterity. Alterity and no longer identity difference dialectic. Okay. Okay, I'm, I will try to answer. Okay. But um, this is so it's slightly complicated. Just first, a, a very simple thing about time. Um, the t time is overdetermined. There are multiple times um, which are congealed in any one so-called time. Um, Nietzsche makes this point when he speaks about the problems of language. And he says the problems of philosophy are in fact often the problems of the ways ancient languages came to describe the world. So the words we use, like being, are themselves mm -hmm 
passed down through the generations, they become so normalized that we think we can ask what is being. And Nietzsche's response is, well, you're asking a question which actually um, is time congealed in the present, and what you need to do is to somehow unravel that time. Um, so the, the, the past and the present overlap. There's no way that one can deny that. I, I indicated that when I spoke about Lloyd's Bank, that Lloyd's Bank is exists on the basis of slavery. Um, the Brussels, the, the massive esplanades in Brussels, um, you can only understand Brussels if you understand that it's built on the labor of, from the rubber plantations. So what we, when we see the world, when we see space, we should also see congealed and overlapping time and forms of exploitation that underpin this. Um, that's so that's the first thing. Second thing, this is just a joke. You spoke about your modest proposal. Of course, the person who first made a modest proposal was Jonathan Swift. <laughs> and Jonathan Swift's modest proposal was a response to hunger in Ireland when in extraordinarily sardonic terms he suggests that given that there is a food shortage and given that lots of babies will die um, it's far better to kill the babies now and eat them because at least the people who are alive will have some food to eat and he then goes through the economics of this logic and uses exactly the terms of the dominant order to justify the idea that it's much better not to allow this flesh to waste, um, but to have it eaten. Um, so, sorry, that's that, that's just um, in reference to your... It's a worrisome analogy, but it's <laughs> supposed to be very mine. Sorry? It's supposed to be Swift, Swift, Swift is being both... But exactly, that's Swift's point. Swift, Swift is having a go. He's, so he presents this as if it is a serious proposal and circulates it as a pamphlet which is then read by people, some of whom actually take it seriously. <coughs> so, and his point precisely is that the English upper classes <coughs> will take this proposal seriously. But anyway, talking of time and modest proposals, um, you, you took me back to another time. Um, and uh, given my Irish history, um, Swift is, is, is one of my, um, my, my heroes. Um, the, but, but what this raises, though, is the question of how one emancipates time from property. And one of the key things, one of the ways in which capital has always operated is through the measurement and the control over time. And the assumption that time can be packaged, that it can be made proper, that one can evaluate the productivity related to specific time. Um, and the idea that underpins the notion of development is precisely development is the reduction of the time that is needed to produce the same goods. So you measure productivity against the reduction in the time that is required because that reduces the cost. So time becomes a cost. Um, now given that, and I, I, I'm not sure I can answer the questions about alterity, identity and difference, but given that, I think one of the forms of resistance is the taking back of time, the reclamation of time. And I'm reminded of Voltaire, the end of Voltaire's Candide, when um, the, the heroes have spent their lives trying to do something, to get wealth, and they've been destroyed by disease and famine. And where does Voltaire finish? Where does Candide finish? He finishes in his garden, doing nothing, reading, planting, growing vegetables. Um, so I think, I think there are some interesting questions around how we use our time. Um, and just completely coincidentally, I have a PhD student who is working on the logistics of time. Um, and one of the things she's looking at is the way in which contemporary logistical, what she calls logistical order, uses time and colonizes time as a measure. And one of the f things that is most disliked by these orders are those who refuse to abide by the time of the world, who act in an untimely fashion. So, Nietzsche's untimely meditations, who, who, who refuse to abide by the demands that on January the 31st my manuscript will be delivered, um, who take time to do these things. You know, even in the world of academia in, in Britain now, 
you have to publish a set number of texts, and if you don't, you don't get your promotion. But what this means, Jerry Cohen, the great Marxist analytical philosopher, Jerry Cohen said, I will write one article per year. He refused to do this mass production of articles. He said, so I've got 50 years of working life, or 40 years, that means I do 40 articles. Why? Because I can only do enough research to make a proper argument for each article in each year. And he, even though he worked at Cambridge, he refused the demands of the system that he writes more than that. And if he was ill, he didn't write the article that year. Um, and leaving aside what he said about writing, um, you should look online on YouTube at Jerry Cohen, um, because he has some extraordinarily funny, improper imitations of other philosophers. Um, he performs being a philosopher, it's very funny. Um, but anyway, thank you. I, the, I, I need to think about the last bit, about the demos and time. Um, <coughs> part of the book, and especially I'm very glad to see that this connection with the property and proper behavior, which I find it were so much interesting for me, but also my question, and so satisfied with it that I don't have any question regarding it. Um, so what I wanted to, and I'm especially thankful for your perspective that I see that you are actually encounter, trying to encounter the problem, not only a debate about some problem in academic life, but to encounter real life problem. And in that sense, I want to think about possibilities of improper politics applied in such situation. And I, I now must confess that a lot of qu the question that I uh, want to ask, a lot of answers are already given, at least, at least your perspective presented and questions of other participants. So I will have two, two questions and one comment that probably function as a bridge between them. Um, the first question is, as Adriana said, I want to think about some kind of proper policies we have actually inside improper politics. So in a way, we can say that uh, anything could be improper politics, but I'm not sure that you would uh, say that uh, racist violence, which is of course, improper politics today, but it is not proper politics you want to say. So i give an example. Uh, you quoted Joshua uh, Ober and the concept I like him in, in his work and that he mentions in a few texts is about democrat, which you call democratic dignity and some other citizenship dignity, political dignity, and he differentiated from aristocratic dignity and uh, natural freedom, dignity, and in most benevolent way I uh, try to understand that it is, he, he argues that this kind of dignity is actually on the basis of uh, European democracy, and in most benevolent way I understand it as a kind of helping those who cannot participate in politics to give them capacity that they can, and that, that is the basis in the, the European democracy. So. But I think when we, of course, in over there is a problem that we can argue that this kind of dignity always functioned in a political exclusion and inclusion with the citizen. That's the problem he don't address uh, correctly. But when we try to be more benevolent, it looks that any kind of democratic improper politics should involve in some sense this kind of uh, democratic or political dignity that we will have those who are for any reason incapable of taking a part in political life happen not only in economical issues addressed mostly in a way that someone don't have a property but also there are a lot of physical issues and in general I think that we are all as individuals need help of others to participate in political life so uh, would it be, in your way, when you try to apply it, some kind of contradiction that there is a kind of proper politics inside improper politics, or it is, let's say, something that, that you would say is part of improper yeah. politics? So my second question, or a bridge to second question, is I just, when I saw the, the quote of Plato Laws, uh, and 
discussion prior to it about who is the people, uh, I just remember the, the very strange connotations of foreigners in Plato Lola. I think the only place he mentioned it, um, uh, I think the Pla Plato laws are not just second the best state, but he's trying to solve problems from the public, yeah. uh, the division between three parts. And yeah, the beautiful situation in law is then all, all are educated and so on. And in one place, let us ask uh, who will then da who will get to, to, to labor this dirty physical job. And he answered, okay, we have slaves, probably they then. And if there is not enough slave, there will be always foreigners who uh, who can be paid to do this job. Yeah. So j <laughs> just a comment about foreigners and other come and to, came to my second question. So my position, what, what I understand as politics, is that politics should in some way bring us together uh, in, in whatever means. So when I look at, at the application of improper politics, it looks like dispersion of activities. And what I'm afraid is that does this dispersion could bring us together in some way? And it's more, more concrete. I think that we actually cannot make something that will have it effective. We, doing it alone, represent demos alone, and again, that, that there has to be something proper in a way bringing us together. That we, we could probably differentiate uh, some improper political acts in the sense you are describing it, which just acting for, for example, for me being part of equal, but not bringing us together. Uh, and, and acts that bring us together in some way. Uh, to, to refer to your example from today, when these diggers from yeah. England didn't said at the end, okay, we will not just reject to give uh, the, to give resources to landowners, but we will give them to the others. Yeah. And so I, I think that is the typical political moment in which they refer to others, potentially all others, in the, that they will distribute. And then we have a very big difference between this act that we are just personally or particularly as particular group acting and this could mobilize others. So that's what my question, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, th thanks very much, Igor. Um, so um, are, are there proper ways of being with inside the improper? Um, and you referred to racist violence. Now, what, what's somebody, one of my colleagues, got very cross with me when I was defending the improper, in, just in a discussion in an English pub. Um, and I think she had too much to drink. Um, but anyway, um, so hopefully she won't watch this video. Um, <laughs> but she, she, she got very cross with me because she used the example of Donald Trump. And she said one of the things that Donald Trump has done is to insist upon the right to be improper in order to have a go at what he calls political correctness, uh, which he says disciplines and disorders and undermines men and means their masculinity has been destroyed, etc., etc. Okay, so he, it, and he's not the only one. There's a range of them who, 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 who insist upon this right. They don't use the language of the improper, but they insist on the right to say or do or act in the way in which they wish without these liberal lefties telling them how to behave. Um, and Trump has played on that. Um, and m m my response is very, very simple, that um, racism is one of the ways in which proper orders have always been constituted. Orders of the proper, um, notions of race, are always attempts to delineate what is proper to one group as opposed to another group. So when somebody uses the example of, of, of race, as, uh, as you did, my response would be that what's actually improper is the refusal of recognition of race. It's not only biologically accurate, it's also improperly political in insisting that the starting point is not the difference. The starting point is to go to your second question, the starting point is what we have in common okay, as human beings, 
our ability to use language, our, our a number of other, you know, just what humans have become. I don't want to reduce this to being. It's 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 what we've become in Nietzsche-like fashion, um, uh, but it's a becoming which is infinite and open in a range of different ways. So I think that um, the insistence on the politics of the proper is always about drawing some limits or invoking some principle to justify the drawing of these limits. Now, the, the example of race is not the best example, okay, because of course they use this, but one might say, to go back to some of the discussions we've had, deliberative democracy, surely you want to say this is more proper than other forms of democratic practice. And my, my response is, is, I think, what I've tried to say consistently. Yes, of course, but we can never include the other, always. There is always a performative dimension to any politics which requires policing, which requires violence. And a Democrat is always sensitive to the moments which, in which the equality we proclaim as proper is at the same time undermined. Um, so I want to hold this open without, w what this doesn't mean is that I'm simply prepared to accept anything. Because one of the things which I said earlier is that I, I kind of make this equation between equality, impropriety and democracy. Um, and for me, the reason equality is improper is precisely because it is not. Okay, it's, it's, uh, the, it, the world we live in, we've never been in a world where there is equality. Now, I'm not sure this answers all of the problems at all, but I, I want to make a point of breaking with the politics of the proper, in part because I, it gives me a different way of thinking about a, what a politics of the left might be as well. Um, one which doesn't simply fall into the traps um, that we have. Um, and, and that links to, to, to Ober's point. One of the problems with Demopolis is the very close to the beginning, he basically says, so the idea of democracy, capability, plus um, the demos, but we don't know the number, and then he says, but this has to be a regime, there have to be boundaries, but I'll leave, he, he literally says, but I'll leave the question of boundaries to one side and just assume that we have this and then ask what a Demopolis would look like. Um, and it's that, it's, that's what I'm interested in, those moments when the people we read decide to leave something aside, which doubtless somebody will come back to me and say, yes, yes, you said this, you, you decided to leave this problem aside, you ignored it, this undermines your text. But all texts uh, provide spaces for intervention. Um, precisely because the text has to place limits. Um, the, the second question about politics bringing us together, sometimes and sometimes not. Um, <coughs> politics sometimes divides. Politics sometimes causes wars. Um, so I, I, I'm, I want to distinguish democracy from politics. Okay. It's certainly my performative way of understanding politics. Yeah. So, but of course, I mean, of course, a democratic enactment is always about bringing people together. Even somebody who acts in the house to insist on an equality which is not there is not simply doing it by themselves. They're doing it because of a whole community of years of struggle in which the inequalities that pervade the private household since Mary Wollstonecroft in the case of England and many other theorists prior to and after that, in which those inequalities have been put into question. So you never simply act by yourself. You always act with a community that you're part of, even if the community is never there. There's always, go, to go back to time, we're, we're always inhabited by ghosts um, that, that inform what we do. So what we do is never our own, even if we think it's our own. Yeah. Just, 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 uh, I agree with you that uh, in, in a way you speak to about also uh, global so sociality. Right? <coughs> so I agree to some degree we are together, and that's also my second point. Okay, we don't need to choose if we are together with other people. Yeah. We are always together yeah. in a some way, but to some degree, to some degree not. And. Uh, when I say bring together, I think that okay, I'm together in a in a, a in in a, in a building with my neighbors, but mm -hmm. yeah, we 
talk about one sentence a year. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, you think to, to some degree we are together with the people in China, in global yeah. community, to some degree not in that sense. I think bring, bring together yeah. is the question of degrees, not, yeah. not only if we are or not. Uh, just, just a really short response. The other thing is just to make the very simple point, which Adriana makes in her work very eloquently, <coughs> that the individual is not. Yeah. The individual is always already a community. And it doesn't matter whether you go via Freud, which I know you don't want to do, um, or, you, or, or you go via, you know, just a very simple sociology of how we come to be. The individual already presupposes others. Um, the, the, the Robinson Crusoe's Island is precisely a, a, a beautiful novel, but, but no more than that. Um. Um, um, I, just, uh, I just I wanted to make room for you and for Jorge and also for Elena, if you want to, yeah, because this is kind of a round table and um, there's no need for only for us to speak. So, if, but if it's okay, just for one more intervention. Yeah, thank you so much. That would be my intervention. So I will be very pleased. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is uncommon, but I'm trying to finish with the, the readings of the text and then really to open up the space for other people as well. I will be very brief because we will be having time to discuss more, and I will be. I will try to be as well. Okay. Um, so I would want to turn us from, from the Demos to the Kratos, yeah. basically. Uh, and I'm referring to the page 8 and the page 9. Um, that's, so, would you consider Kratos to be understood as agency? I know this is a far-fetched one, but if the Demos is an ever-growing number of limitless people who are equal, would Kratos refer to a, as Ober says, activated political capacity or agency which enacts the equality of, of the demons? Why this would be meaningful for me is because I want to extract agency from the individual activity. I want to see it as collective as well. So, and why Kratos is also important, this is the reference to uh, Wendy Brown's Home Politicus and, and Hobbes in uh, and, and the, the, the precise sentences. Hobbes, for example, assumes that human beings in a state of nature are equally capable, mm -hmm. but this equality results in war of all against all. This is your sentence. And so now I'm referring to this Kratos' agency, Kratos' activated political capacity. Can we understand this capability as Kratos? even if that's not a demos Kratos. If not, then that means that the demos must rule um, in order to be recognized as the demos, um, the body of the homini politi politica, that, that rule transformed the Kratos in some way from collective agentic capability into, for example, counter-violence in, in Balibar's terms, institutional order that prevents war of all against all. Mm. So in that sense, what is the Kratos? And it's, we all look at the demons all the time, yeah. but we somehow tend to forget the Kratos part. <laughs> and the one last little sentence, uh, which I know it's not, uh, it, it begs for one day of answering, but because I know you, you worked on life, and we haven't, I think, mentioned life yeah. during these two days, there is this reference to Plato where you say the proper life can only be lived if those who have private property are not those who rule. It's the page 13. Yeah, yeah. My, my question would be what is a proper life? And of course, regardless of Plato, what would be the improper life? I mean, we're talking about politics, demons, yeah. Kratos, but, but what about life? That's me. So thank you for Kratos, because this is um, again one of the, the central arguments. And I, I'm doing something which I, I don't know if this works, so I'll just be explicit. It might just not work. But um, what I like about the way Ober reads Kratos to start with is that he reads it as activated capacity, political capacity, but he specifically says that it does not have to refer to a regime. So unlike Archaea in monarchy, which is always a regime type of rule. Kratos can be referred to a regime, 
but it's not limited to the possibility of a regime. And I then, so that's the first step, I, I take that from over. Um, and what that means, of course, is that democratic power, or power, doesn't have to be related back to a regime. It then allows us to remember Foucault's account of power and the various mechanisms, the various places, the disciplinary orders through which power is both enacted and at the same time enabled. People forget this reading Foucault, is that it, these regimes are also forms of enablement. They capacitate certain people to act in certain ways. They distribute the possibilities of statements being recognized as legitimate or illegitimate, depending upon the status that's accorded to the one who issues the, state, the statement. So the same statement issued by a doctor has a completely different order of legitimacy to exactly the same words issued by the patient. Um, even though the words are the same, even though they might describe exactly the same situation. So, so I, like, I really like this, this in Foucault. But then I take Brown, this is the third part of the argument, who recognizes that Foucault never gives us the link between power and the possibility of demos, of a demos. So I, I, I sort of put together these arguments a bit too quickly here, in which I say, okay, Kratos is not limited to regimes. Um, with Foucault, we can recognize the multiple forms that power takes. But unlike Foucault, we can also begin to imagine forms of enactment of power Within these, active, within these areas, these different places, which put into question the distribution and the organization of those powers, not simply as resistance, which is what Foucault tends to focus on, the possibility of resistance, but as enactment. <coughs> um, so, so, so that's the idea. And if you want to use the word agency, I don't have a problem with that. Um, the, uh, as long as we with Foucault recognize that our agency is always already organized within a set of practices which determine what does and does. You know, even this type of forum, it depends upon a specific discursive ordering of space, of time, of responsibility. Um, every classroom implies this whole institutional apparatus that we don't normally see. So we need, I think, to, to to recognize that agency, um, enablement and agency depend in part upon those prior orders, but they're not limited by them. They can break with them, or break with, even within them in order to reorder. Some of the, what Foucault speaks about, what happened in prisons, for example, mm -hmm. some of the prison riots. Um, uh, life, the politics of life in Plato's Republic. Um, I, I, one of the, I, have, I haven't spoken about this in detail in my book, but one of the examples I use, um, when I talk about property, there are two things that have happened to property since the early 1990s. Um, well, it goes back much further, but in the, in, the 18, in, in the late 18th century and the early 19th century, there was an attempt to establish global forms of patent law, so that patents that were invented in one country would be protected in other countries. And there, since the, I think the Vienna Convention, which is in about 1840 or something, that those patent laws were very limited. There had to be a new invention, um, which an inventor had made that did not rely upon nature. One of the big changes that took place in 1979 was the argument that natural things could be patented provided the isolation of the natural thing required human intervention. So for example, the genetic marker for diabetes exists in its natural state. We didn't know it existed. Now doctors or researchers have worked out that this genetic marker exists. And of course to develop medicine, they require investment. So what's been allowed is the patenting of the genetic marker, which means that the collective genetic humanity that we are is now increasingly being privatized and owned. Um, so the politics of life is really, really interesting because it's not, the old argument was you could never have, pro in the post-slavery um, period, you could never own the body of another. Slavery was basically, the slave was my property, that comes to an end, then we get the idea that you can sell your labor as a property. 
but no one can have property in life. Now we've returned back to the possibility of having property in life, but the life in which we can have property is a life dissociated from the individual body. It has to do with the genetic makeup of population as a whole. So this, this is one of the examples I use talking about property. The other thing that's happened is that property laws have been internationalized so that there are a set of conventions which regulate and which nation states are required to work with. So this is a long way of, of saying that I'm really interested in the new politics of life, which is not just about the privatization of genetic materials in the human species, it's also about the privatization of the genetic markers of, for example, crops and food. Um, a number of years ago, a group of Mexican farmers brought a claim against an American company because the American company had brought the claim against them. They had been grown a particular type of potato for thousands of years. Knowledge of the, the mechanisms for doing so had been passed down through generations. The company did the research that allowed them to identify the genetic markers for this potato and then produced, um, having produced it, then were given a property right in the genetic makeup of the potato, they then went to the Mexican farmers and insisted that they should be paying them because they were using what they had patented as property. So, so the, the new politics of life actually I think goes beyond the analyses of Agamben and, and Esposito and others. Esposito actually speaks about the improper interestingly, but I think the new politics of life is, is very, very interesting, uh, but it's only kind of a footnote. Um, to my account of the redistribution of the politics of property. I don't know if that answers. But yes, thank you, Mark. And now, uh, oh, I have a microphone. Uh, thank you very much. I'm an observer and an homage to this great circle. Sir, so what was your name? Christopher. Um, Thanks. And uh, Doherty. And uh, this uh, great circle of philosophers invite us uh, vagabonds through. Um, to clarification, uh, it's always fun to make fun of oppressed people, so Swift is very funny with the eating of the uh, you know, Irish children. However, if he had made it against English children, he would probably have been burned at the stake. And no one would have thought of seeing the humor in it, although it is a very humorous text and a wonderful sardonic text. Uh, democracy is a very a beautiful uh, uh, word. And it's sort of like marriage. It's an ideal at first, and later needs a lot of work. <laughs> and uh, is there a difference? I, I take it, uh, Mark, that you, there's a difference for you between democracy and equality. My question is this, or rather my observation is this. There is such a thing as regressive equality or egalitarianism <coughs> practiced for example, in economically totalitarian states like the United States uh, and Britain, um, in which institutionalized acceptance of the ideology of democracy and, and uh, equality is then used, to use an old phrase, to beat the people with, a stick to beat the people with. It does not make us uh, uh, sup uh, as a uh, uh, facile uh, distinction like in Stalinist takeover of the Soviet Union and that kind of regressive egalitarianism if you want. But there is such a thing as regressive egalitarianism and it, it is I think what passes for equality. I'm, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm a, a very late into these seminars, what is equality? And second of all, can we really say that today, with the economic state, that people are not living in a regressive egalitarianism? Uh, I think, is it O'Connor who was Fiscal, the capital stat? Yeah. Capital Fisc stat, wasn't that his thing? Capital Fiscal crisis of the state. Yes, I mean, that's what we call this, all this freedom and democracy is basically just I mean, when you say the new politics, I'm sorry, did you say the new politics of life? No, I, I, I did use that phrase, but I'm referring specifically well, the new to the genetic of life intervention. Sounds like the old politics of money. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And indeed, you said earlier that 
I mean, it's very nice uh, for all of us. Thank you for bringing up Habermas. Uh, uh, he is, for some reason, I don't know, pushed aside. Um, and um, you have to have something to be able to do something. And democracy is what you do. There are hiatuses. Let's say the Rooseveltian period in the 1930s in the United States or the welfare state set up by uh, Britain after the Second World War that result in strange democratic actions. And would you agree with dividing democracy from, as ideology from democratic action? That's the second tier. And the third is, for example, in the welfare state of Britain, it, it created a thing called, in the north of Ireland, called education, which liberated very poor people in the north of Ireland through education and resulted in the movement for the independence of the north of Ireland from the United Kingdom. Um, uh, analogies can be seen uh, in the United States, obviously. Uh, but only two revolutions that I know of were made truly in the name of equality. That was the French Revolution, of course, and the Mexican Revolution. Uh, the Mexican Revolution hijacked is basically resulting in your crop uh, incidents examples uh, that you just gave. Second of all, uh, Democracy and equality, I believe, were the goals of the French Revolution. Um, and we know what it segued into. Um, but the, um, the idea of equality, I do not think, is, is that clear. And I believe that it is, in fact, uh, a regressive equality that we are suffering now, which punishes uh, the Okay. My point about the uh, North of Ireland and all that is that there are within the limits of the institutions set up in a constitutional democracy the possibility of democratic action. And uh, democratic action is, I believe, what is the focus of your, of yeah. your, of your hopes. And what if I may add just one single caveat. One of the greatest books I think ever written is Democracy in America by de Tocqueville, in which in exactly he addresses the idea of ideology, or rather democracy as an ideology, which he says is, which he says the Americans call freedom, which he reminds us in America is not a form of liberty, as in France, but rather a form of power. And second of all, um, I believe he makes a distinction between democracy and equality in that book. Okay. That's quite a bit. Okay. Okay. And what invites if somebody else wants to contribute in some way? Would you like? But I will, I'll have to ask I you to be short because we have um, we have the airports. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Airport. Well, first of all, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for the. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for for your presence today and and for the seminar it was wonderful, though I I didn't read the the paper so I don't know exactly the details of the um, of the research. Uh, however, we share some common interests and we have some common friends. So I will I will ask from my point of view, mm -hmm. um, from of course about um, this topic that you are discussing today here. I'm from Latin America. And um, initially, from the University of Havana, I was professor there for the last nine years. And I'm used to see every year in the university, every semester, we receive students from social movements uh, from different countries of Latin America, from Brazil, from Argentina, Chile, Mexico. Even I remember Zapatistas going there to the Faculty of Philosophy to receive classes of Marxism-Leninism, <laughs> because that's what I studied, Marxism-Leninism. I, I didn't tell you during the break that my diploma says Marxist-Leninist philosophy, yes, just like right. that, the bachelor degree. So in any case, we receive students, we receive members of social movement. Uh, recently from Colombia, I had one student. And they, they go to Cuba trying to, to get not only information, but just certain kind of guidance in their 
struggle, their fights against the regimes in Latin America. And listening to you uh, today, uh, I, I, I'm just trying to get the idea, the, the, the central idea that you are defending, and I think if I understood, uh, your argument goes around the idea that democracy, in every democracy you find a certain, an emergence, let's say, of a certain inequality. So that's somehow, that happened somehow, okay? I, I, I will repeat again, I didn't read the paper, so I'm just guessing in a lot of aspects. My question is the following. What we should say to these social movements, or what we should say, for example, in Cuba, that today they are making, uh, you're looking at me like this right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to follow, yeah. So what we should say, for example, in Cuba, that today we are under a transition of change, and they are defending the idea that we should implement, a so, how, how they say, social, uh, uh, socialism with democracy. The democratic socialism, exactly, is the yeah. translation. A democratic socialism as a superior form of the capitalist democracy. So taking all the ideas that you're discussing today on this table, what we should say to them in terms of democracy, like, hey guys, I mean, what you're trying to pursue is totally pointless, so I mean, uh, what we should <laughs> say to the students that are coming from all the social movement from Latin America, what we should do in um, I mean, I, I think my, my question, it, it has to be also, I mean, not only with politics, also with ethics and moral questions, like what we should do as left, if we can define that somehow, uh, to change a little bit the situation. Eh? Okay, um, I will Thank try you. And reply very quickly try to, be to, to both. So my apologies if I don't deal with everything um, that was suggested. First thing, what is equality? I don't know, but I do know inequality. Um, so I, I think there's something interesting about equality that we know is in the negative. We can identify very easily the forms that inequality takes. Equality is invoked as a challenge to those forms of inequality, but inevitably in so doing we, we tend to go back to, to what Jorge has just said, we then tend to reintroduce new forms of inequality. So, so in one sense equality both is, but is also an ever receding horizon. Um, Secondly, with regards to regimes, I'm not quite sure what you meant by regressive equality. Um, egalitarianism. Regre regressive egalitarianism. Um, oh, I mean, this is this is just clearly not equality or democracy. I mean, um, so so I just I just accept that there's no possible ways we could describe that, or even the welfare state that existed in Britain. I said earlier on, we need to identify those practices which are in some sense attempting to enact equality from those which are not. And the very same institution, the very same state, the very same person may do both at the same time. Um, which is... Uh, no, I don't think so. It, 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 well, egalité, but I, I want to very carefully distinguish. It's a mistake that's made in some of the literature on equality to distinguish equality from equivalence. Equality does not mean treating everybody the same. Equality means recognizing the differences that make a difference to the way a person can live their lives. Um, if we simply, if a wheelchair user doesn't have a mode of access into a building, they're not being treated equally. I'm, I'm just, I'm conscious of time because I, I do have to get a plane. But so, um, the and yeah, thank you. The, the, the French Revolution. The only thing I would note is that the second. Uh, the Declaration of Freedom, um, Equality, Liberty, Fraternity, and then the Defense of Property. So, so let's. I, I want to be a little bit careful about the debates around, um, yeah, a, a, and nation, property and nation, which are which are intrinsic to this. So yes, so and first, uh, was the rights of man. first is the rights of man. Yeah. Um, but then, um, uh, and then very briefly to Jorge. I don't know. Um, I mean, but it's in part, this depends upon how we understand the global order we live in and the specificities of the different orders within, a, within the global order that, that we are part of. And I said to you in the break, my experience of Havana was like a world that I've never experienced, I've never seen. The conversations I had, the ways people live, are fundamentally different. In many respects, far better 
than the ways in which, for example, we live in Britain with a private housing market, which means that many people never have the possibility of secure housing. Um, so in many ways far better than that, but in other respects far more restrictive. So the, the only thing, when students ask me what do you mean by equality, the only thing I, I can really say um, is just be consistent. If you're committed to equality, then ask yourself, is what I am doing now distributing, allowing for, reinventing the ways we live that treats others in the same way as I expect to be treated? Um, you know, that's an old Christian dictum. Uh, it's not, and when you say treat others the same as I expect, it doesn't mean treating them the same as you expect, but it does mean um, just giving the basic forms of recognition, to go back to Honneth, etc., the basic forms of recognition that we take for granted in our everyday lives. Um, but, I, but, but in terms of what is to be done, I think that depends very much on the context, the situation, the particular struggle, the authorities that you're dealing with, the power of the police, the violence that will be unleashed or not. Um, that this is always contextual. Um. Thank you, Mark. Um. Thank you very much.